be leaving. Um, go, go ahead. After the first public hearing, I'll be leaving the meeting. I just All want right. to you know that. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. All set, Steve. All right. The chair notes the time is 6.05. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Present. Mr. Everett Henry. Present. Mr. Philip White. Present. Mr. David Sloviter. Present. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Chris Restrup, planning director for the town, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, a planner for the town. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the meet members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 48, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed on, via the town of Amherst's YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or to gather additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing for the variance to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda is uh, minutes, approval of meeting minutes or consideration of approval of meeting minutes for March 28th, 2024, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-18, ASD Shootsbury MA, Massachusetts Solar LLC, request for a special permit under section 3.340 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 9.35 megawatt DC, 4.4 megawatt AC, ground mounted solar photovoltaic array spanning 41 acres on a 102 acre site with accompanying battery energy storage system at three parcels of land owned by WD Crow Cowles Inc. identified as map 9B parcels 11 and 12 and map 9D, parcel 27, on Shootsbury Road, RO, outlying resident zoning district. Frontage and access to subject parcels of land are located between 187 and 201 Shootsbury Road. This is continued from um, February 22, 2024. ZBA FY 2024-12, Bra Brian Baker, formerly Patricia Tejan, request for a special permit under section 6.31 of the zoning bylaw to allow for the construction of a single family home on a flag lot with requested waivers from building uh, from building um, plans at 386 Shea Street, map 20D, parcel 78, 
RN Neighborhood Residence Zoning District. This is continued from February 22nd, 2024. Following that, there's general public comment period on matters um, not before the board tonight and other business not anticipated within for the last 48 hours. Before we begin consideration of our two agenda items, I want to make clear that we are not going to complete consideration of the Shootsbury Solar Special Project Permit tonight. Tonight is an opportunity for the petitioner to inform the board of modifications to the project, to permit the board to raise questions and understand the project, to hear public comment, and to consider whether to direct the staff to engage peer reviewers. There will undoubtedly be additional public hearings on the solar project, and there could be further modifications to that project, perhaps from other town boards or as a result of peer review. So I want everyone to know that this is not the last opportunity for public comment. We also have another application that has been continued from February on the agenda, and I wanna make sure that we get to that application as well tonight. So my suggestion is that we spend the first hour and a half on the petitioner's presentation and questions from the board. At about 7.30, we will break for five minutes and we'll have time for public comment. I anticipate that that will be about a half hour of public comment. Then we will move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open to consider peer review, the peer review motions we have before us tonight. After we have completed these matters, we'll move to special project application for, or special permit application for Shea Street. And I anticipate that'll be about 8.15 to 8.30. Does that work for members of the board as in terms of a schedule? Without any objection, all right. So the first matter is there are any disclosures from members of the board? And before we go to the first um, order of business, Rob, you, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to uh, call out a typo for the second petition. Um, it's actually 368A Shea Street and not 386. Uh, when creating the oh. agenda, I uh, put in a typo there. So I just want to acknowledge that publicly. So the address is 368A Shea Street. Thank you. All right. I'll try to remember that. <laughs> Get it right in, in the motions. All right. Thank you, Rob. Um, the first order of business is a consideration of meeting minutes from March 28th, 2024. I reviewed those um, minutes. I think they accurately reflect the meetings. Does anybody have any comments, changes, or suggestions? If not, I'd entertain a motion that we approve the minutes from um, of the meeting of Thursday, March 28th, 2024. Do I have such a motion? I move. I move. And second? Aye. We got, um, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes from March 28th. The chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. Mr. Meadows? I, I don't believe that I was on that board, so. I'll abstain. All right. And Mr. Henry? Um, also abstain. All right. The votes are three to zero to two. Three is what's required, provides a majority and what's required for, for approval of the minutes. The minutes are approved. The next order of business is a public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-18 ASD Shootsbury MA Solar LLC. On this panel, Mr. White is not included. Um, you're more than welcome to stay and listen, or you can um, do whatever else you have to do for the next hour and a half. Um, but um, the panel is myself, Mr. Sloboder, Mr. Henry, and Mr. Meadows. Um, so, um, First off, there's not been a site visit conducted since the last hearing on this matter. And I want to run through the submissions that have been provided to, to the town and to town staff since our last meeting. So those are identified in the project, the draft project application report dated uh, April 19th, and they're in red. So there's a new battery energy storage system narrative there's an a new application change log dated April 17th. 
There's a new order of resource area delineation dated, um, though an update is pending, we don't have that yet. The stormwater management report um, updated April 17th. There's a stormwater pollution prevention plan updated April 17th. There is a, um, there are ZBA, there's an updated plans and um, prepared by a firm named Verdan Terra dated April 17th. And there's a new construction phasing narrative dated April 17th, 2024. I think those are all the, the, the submissions from the applicant and the town. Um, we do have, I have noted two um, public comments that are noted in the, on the, in the record. One is from Robert Buchcha and Jenny Kalik dated April 24th with a attachment. And another is um, an email from Michael Lipinski forwarded by Robert Bushka from with responses from Ms. Brestrup dated February 23rd. Are there any other public comments that we know of or other submissions that I have to note? Ms. Brestrup? Um, I'm sorry, I blanked out for a minute. Did you list the letter from me about the planning board comments um, from no. October 4th? and also um, planning board minutes from October 4th, from their October 4th meeting. You didn't zone out. I did not do that. I thought that was part of this whole package, but that's, yes, we have um, a letter from you uh, dated April 18th, which has the uh, planning board, summary of the planning board meeting on this. We have, and I don't know if this is a separate piece from that, we have a Pure Sky Energy Historical Project outline. Uh, there's no date on that. We have a Department of Environmental Protection um, Wetlands Policy Program 17-1 um, photo, vo Photovoltaic System Solar Array Review. Um, the effective date of that is, is back in 2017, but I think that's a state of policy. There's also a white paper from the Amherst Water Supply Protection Committee, uh, which was approved, the, uh, that statement was approved, or white paper was approved on 20, November 10th, 2022. Those are the ones I, the submissions I have that accompanied the planning board documents that you sent me. Did you mention the uh, minutes of the planning board meeting of October 4th, 2023? I did not. Do I have those? I have. Oh, that's what it, you have. Um, I see that you have said that there is a there was a meeting on the twenty fourth of the fourth of October, and I I think those are not those are not specific minutes, but it's your representation of those. I don't see yeah, that I have minutes. We did but, submit um, minutes, and maybe they didn't get into the packet, so. The minutes of October 4th of 2023 should be part of the record and along with the letter that uh, I wrote summarizing that meeting. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. You. Chair, uh, there's a few other documents that were submitted after that project application report was created as well that I could mention to you, uh, yeah. just so if they're on the record as well. These are documents that were sent to us from a Butters. Um, so the first one is a peer review memo from a... Uh, environmental specialist company called Fleetwood that was submitted from in a butter. Um, we also have a draft ANRAD that was submitted by in a butter as well. Um, draft order, I'm sorry, ORAD findings um, that were submitted as well. And then we have a document submitted from Ginny Kalik on April 24th, 2024, which is uh, emails that were requested through a public records request um, the ones that we have involve peer review discussions for this project between myself, Ms. Brestrup, and Aaron Jack, our uh, conservation, uh, sorry, wetlands specialists. So um, those are the documents that were afforded to us from Butters to include in the packet. And I know it's a lot of documents that we have, um, but that's all we, to, to my knowledge, that's all that we've received prior to this meeting. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Could we make could we make sure that all of those documents are are in the uh, website 
because yep. they, they are not and open up the comments and put the comments into the comments section please yeah, definitely do that we should have those available and then we and let's also do um rob let's have that in the next those that you mentioned that we are now putting in the the uh, online form that mm -hmm. Craig has mentioned um, have that sent in the next packet then we, when we have another hearing on this matter so that we have copies of them in the next um, board packet. Cool. All right. Good. Are there any other submissions that um, we should make note of? Nope. All right. So um, now we move to cons to uh, the public hearing on that matter and who's rep who's representing the petitioner. So in attendance, we have uh, Corey McCandless from Pure Sky, and then we have Tom Reedy, who is the uh, um, attorney for Pure Sky. So let me go ahead and promote them to panelists. Right. They should be joining us shortly. Also, Mr. Chair, I want to make note that in attendance right now, we have uh, 26 um, members of the public. Yep. All right, we've got uh, the panelists. So um, Mr. Reedy or Ms. Uh, Corey, what's your your last name? Uh, it's it's pronounced McCandless. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, no uh, all I see is M. Oh, so sorry. Name, yes. Give me an address for the record. Uh, Corey McCandless. Um, uh, my my address is um, 1460 Farnham Point Road in uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Recently moved from Maine. Um, and yes, I can send up my my contact information. Um, Rob has it, so if he needs to share it with the with the rest of the board members, we can make that happen. Good for the record, and Mr. Reedy. Sure, and maybe before I start the whole thing with the um, uh, address and everything, if we could get Chris, maybe Steve Loss as well. Uh, he's the engineer for the site, so I have a feeling he's going to be doing some talking this evening. That'd be great. Sure. I will send him a panelist invite Perfect. right now. Thank you very much. Uh, and so for the record, Tom Reedy, I'm going to turn you with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst, um, 6 Southeast Street, uh, corner of Southeast and Northeast Street, right next to the Fort River School. Um I am here on behalf of ASD Shoots Bree Mass Solar, uh, who I think we're just going to call Pure Sky because it's quite a bit easier. Um, with me, uh, Corey McCandless from Pure Sky, and also Steve Loss, who will join us, and Chris Connolly, both from Bird and Terra, and they are the site designers uh, for this project. And I think, you know, the, uh, Mr. Chairman, you did a good job with the introduction. Um, you know, we don't expect to be closed this evening. We don't expect to be closed for, I mean, frankly, a few months. Like there's quite a bit that needs to be done. And quite frankly, I think what we think one of the most important things is, is to get a peer reviewer. Um, I know that we had this discussion back in October about a peer reviewer and the scope of the peer reviewer or peer reviewers, plural, um, and what they were going to do. And Hopefully this evening you're able to authorize the staff to contract with at least one of the peer reviewers for a, a better energy storage in the glare and then to uh, issue requests and hopefully contract with another peer reviewer or peer reviewers for the balance of the information. And so, you know, tonight we'll, we'll go over the, the plans. We can talk high level about some of the changes um, that we've been working on. I'm going to give you an update of kind of where we've been and, and where we expect to go. But I would hesitate to get into the nitty gritty of all of the site plans, the construction logistics plans, et cetera, until that peer reviewer really has the time to dig in. And it's without any disrespect to the board, but there's a lot of detail here. And to have uh, an engineer who's used to seeing this or to have professionals who are used to seeing this type of material I think it's going to help everybody. And so I think in our mind, it would be, you know, high level discussions today, obviously receive all the public comment that that the public that you're OK with having the public make. And then to continue this hearing to I think your June 13th hearing, which I think is the your first one in June. Uh, 
as either a check-in or potentially the peer reviewer will be done by then, which frankly we doubt, but just as a check-in. And then maybe a real substantive meeting starting, let's say in July, where in July we can start to compartmentalize the different areas that the board really wants to dive into, whether it's you know construction logistics or battery energy storage or stormwater, um, et cetera. And so just because it, it's a, a it has a lot of, there's a lot of facets to this project and we don't want to skimp on any of the details because I think Pure Sky has done a really nice job of assembling those details and they're only going to get better, more refined and justified through the peer review process. And there may be some comments in the peer review process that cause the plans to change. And as was mentioned, there may be um, some comments uh, in the NOI process, which I'll talk about in a minute, that may cause the plan to change. So this is more of a, here's what we've been doing. Here's where we are. Here's where we see that we're going conversation. If at any point you want to get into the details, we're ready to get into the details. Um, and I don't want to, I just don't know that it's going to be the most valuable expenditure of everybody's time. And so, I, you know, I appreciate that. I think it makes sense to do a high level review, open up if board members have questions and details, they're free to ask those, you know, absolutely. Mr. Perfect. Okay. Right. And um, so I think, a, I think a good high level review makes sense. Uh, the things that have changed in the new submissions, and I agree with you that this, um, there's going to be further hearings on this. I don't, I'm not quite sure on the dates. Um, but um, there will be further hearings on this and we can get into probably subject by subject matter hearings um, in the days to come. But I want to do want to see what the changes are. I think that's important and I want to provide public comment. Absolutely. Um, excellent. So uh, where we've been, we've last time we were here was in February. You know, we, we got some feedback. We've been working on the plans. I'll have Corey talk about the battery energy storage update and then Steve talk about the, the plan update. Um, we've also been in front of the Conservation Commission in that uh, ANRAD, abbreviated Notice of Resource Area Delineation, ORAD, which is what's issued once you receive that, once they approve the ANRAD, you get the Order of Resource Area Delineation. Uh, we're just about there. So we were in front of the Conservation Commission last evening. There are what I would consider ministerial additions to the plan and literally to put on the dates that the plan had been revised and submitted to the Conservation Commission. Uh, nothing substantive, nothing about where the, the wetlands are, but just really more ministerial. Uh, the commission felt it wisest to wait until that was updated. So when they approve the plan, that is included with it. So we expect that, fingers crossed, in the next two weeks at their next meeting. Um, and so that's where the ORAD will be. I mentioned NOI, so notice of intent. We are going to require a notice of intent because we are going to be within jurisdictional areas. Um, and so we're going to have to submit a notice of intent to the Conservation Commission to get approval to do work within those jurisdictional areas. So there's going to be a parallel track with the Conservation Commission, uh, along with obviously the, the Zoning Board of Appeals process we're going through. Um, okay, going any further, Mr. Reedy, we just need Mr. Loss to identify himself and and give his address for the record. And then he can speak when needed. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, Steve Loss, 240 Hunters Chase, Edders, Pennsylvania, 17319. Thank you. All right, Mr. Reedy, go ahead. Okay. Uh, and I'm almost done anyways. I, I And that's really, that's really where we are. Uh, CONCOM was last night. We anticipate NOI. We already talked about what we hope to get out of this meeting as far as authorizations for the peer review and then really let the peer reviewers dig into the substantive aspects of this project. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Corey to talk about the battery energy storage and then to Steve to talk about the updates to the plans. Great, thank you so much, Tom. Um, yes, good evening, everybody. Um, so since we have last uh, met with you folks back in February, um, we have switched our battery and energy storage uh, provider that was uh, Powen. Um, we are, since then, we have made a business decision to switch to Canadian Solar. Um, they have a Soul Bank um, energy unit that will be installed on the site um, as 
as you may or may not know, energy storage, uh, you know, for any projects above 500 kilowatts, they do require per Massachusetts state law, energy storage systems to be included in the scope of the project. So that's why we are including um, energy storage at this project. And um, in our discussions with Powen previously, they had indicated to us that they were only interested in working with um, solar developers for portfolio size orders of 100 megawatt hours or more. Um, these systems are incredibly expensive. We do not have that sort of need. So we started exploring other manufacturers and we landed on Canadian Solar. So I have since then provided Rob with several documents about the energy storage systems. I'm happy to go into detail on any of those materials with the board. And um, that's that's really, uh, and, and nothing else has changed since then. The pad has shrunk because it is a smaller system. So the equipment pad is a little bit smaller. So if there are no other questions, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Steve to talk about the changes to the site plan. May I, may I ask think, a question? Are there any questions on the solar? Let's, let's focus on the, the um, change of the battery storage. Mr. I, do have one, I do have one question. Yep. Um, what is the big difference between these two companies in terms of what they offer? Yeah, so they offer different, so every battery manufacturer has proprietary information that they include in their uh, batteries. Um, so the actual component of the battery is different. I cannot tell you off the top of my head the difference between Powen and Canadian Solar batteries. Um, it is included in the spec sheets that have been provided to the board. Um, if you'd like, I can do a, you know, I can bring our battery and energy storage specialists to the table and maybe give a more thorough presentation on the technical differences between the two. Um, but otherwise it's, it's, it's essentially, I mean, it's very similar to the Powen product. Um, they, some come with suppression systems. Some um, models, you know, have the option to not include those. Um, we opted to not include the fire suppression system because of the concern with um, those being deployed and getting into the ground. Um, they also, some sometimes they include um, material that, um, or, you know, in chemicals that may get into the ground. Um, they do have containment systems installed that are designed to um, to contain all of that runoff. Um, but with this one, we did not. We opted to not include it. So that's probably so, the biggest change. So one of the concerns that I had um, was that the company prior to this one had batteries and reports of batteries um, with fire issues. And so that's the heart. That is the heart of my question in terms of the technical differences. So, um, are there different safeguards, um, different components to make up of this battery that minimizes or reduce um, those catching fire? Yeah. So with fires and lithium-ion batteries, um, the the main reason for those fires is water contamination. Um, with the Canadian solar products, they are designed to um, not have any sort of leakage or any sort of water contamination. They have a proven track record to show that that hasn't happened. Um, and we're very confident that they're safe um, systems. And, you know, we're, we're working with the fire department to make sure that they are installed properly and function correctly. They're also monitored as well. Um, so, the, I mean, they're they're a very safe system. They're similar to the um, to other you know standalone energy storage project projects that have been permitted throughout Massachusetts um, and have a, a good track record of safety. So, thank you, yeah. Mr. Henry. I'd, I'd like to just follow up on your question, if I could. Um, and there is there's been reports of Howans of fires. Are there? You said that they have a good track record. Are you telling me that? We're not going to, they don't have, they have no fires or is it, um, what, what is a good track record in your opinion? So I was uh, speaking to the Canadian solar product. Um, right. Not, not power. Right. I know. I'm speaking to the, the new one. You're, what's the track record they have? It's, I mean, 
In Massachusetts, I myself do not know of any issues with Canadian solar products within Massachusetts. I, that's not to say that there hasn't been in the past, um, but they, it's, they're, they're very reliable and they have been on the market for a long period of time. Um, so if that's something that I can uh, provide to the board, um, you know, before the next time we appear in front of you folks, um, I can certainly do, do so. Mr. Henry, would you find that valuable? I would. Um, I, I, I would, yes. Okay. Track record. So if you can give us a, a, you know, the incidents, if there are incidents of fires with, the, you know, with this model or similar models, it would be very yeah. valuable. Yeah. yeah, we can certainly provide that. Incidents. I don't know if fire is the right word, but you know what, we're, you know what we're getting at is the um, fires or just discharge or problems with that. Be Any sort of incident. Yep. Certainly. And would that be, I, I, then we'll get to Mr. Loss here in a second. Would that be something that the peer review folks are looking at, either Rob or, or Ms. Brestrup? Is that something they'd be yes. looking at, right? Yes, they are. They're going to be looking at the specifications. They're going to see if it's appropriate for this project, and they're going to see um, track, record. Pre track record and previous history of where else it was used and, and safety and all that stuff. Good. All right. Are there any other questions on the battery storage system before we move on to the changes in the site plan? Okay, Mr. Loss. <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah, changes to the site plan. Uh, obviously, there's been some uh, more peer review wetland work going on with uh, Goddard and the CONCOM. We've imported those revised boundaries. Um, and a couple of small additional internal wetlands into our site plan. Uh, we've revised our uh, stormwater and erosion control measures accordingly, we moved all the panels out of any buffer zones for any of those features. And uh, you know we've shrunk the equipment pad as Corey just discussed, uh, revised our stormwater according to that uh, as well. Um, and uh, you know, just updated stormwater in ENS based off of off of those changes. Um, one other thing we have implemented is uh, the screw type um, rack for the screw type post for the racking. So, but um, can you elaborate on that? Um, I remember that was a discussion. Is that the way in which it's affixed to the ground? And is and it, why yeah, it's yep, yep, just a. a Couple couple inch diameter post that screws into the ground for uh, minimal minimal disturbance or what, what could possibly be called impervious. And are those? Yeah, you know, I was trying to understand the the site plan um, that was contained in the the packet we got. Is that are those changes reflected in this April seventeenth? And do, they, do you show what it was and what the change has been made or how, how do I read that? How do I know that what changes? Uh, oh, how, well, the changes are on the, on the plan. You, you can uh, see the smaller pad. Um, are the changes in green? Um, no, no, no we, we don't have the changes in, in green. The, the, uh, let's see here. So the wetlands or you know the areas that weren't included in the um, CONCOM uh, or the ANRAD determination of the wetlands, they're in that hatch, the hatching that's shown on the outside. The, the green areas are the wetlands. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah. Would it be helpful if we screen shared the plans so we can see? Just, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Let's just screen share the plans. Okay, if somebody from the applicant team could do that, if they're able to, that'd be really helpful um, to to the board. Let me see. I'm just trying I... to get a feel for the the size of the changes. I know you've described them as small, but I think it's probably valuable for the board just to see the extent of the changes and the degree to which the changes are made. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Sure. sure. Okay. <clears throat> So yeah, 
you see this hatching, these hatched areas on the outside here. Um, they've been identified. We got this from from Goddard. Um, they've been identified as area not included in the ANRAD determination. Um, so you'll see those out there. All the belt buffers around the perimeter that have changed, or you know, been ever so slight on the perimeter, um, but the bu the buffer areas have been adjusted according to any of those changes. There's a few internal uh, wetlands in here, um, and then here is your your smaller pad area. The equipment pad is this. It's a mm -hmm. square here. It's ninety by eighty on this on this rendition. So the principal changes are up in the upper right hand corner as I'm looking along that the the buffer of the wetland. Is that right? Uh, there were some changes on this this northern side. Um, there were some changes in and along here. Um, so we did actually move this turnaround down. I think this kind of bumped out up here where we originally had to turn around and we just slid that down a, a little bit to the south. So that is, would, uh, would stay outside of the, of any buffer disturbance. And Steve, um, Steve made that change in response to the fire department transmittal comment. Um, they asked for a turnaround at least 100 feet away from the equipment pad. So we were able to incorporate that um, request for the change. Great. Mr. Meadows, I see your hands up and then Ms. Presper. Uh, I, I'm curious, I, if I recall correctly, you originally had a uh, tracking system and now it appears as though it's a stationary system. Can you tell me what, what why you made that change? And what the uh if i'm correct and no. and what the sizing is now of the entire system um the the system is still a tracker system so we have not we have not moved to fixed tilt um the size i guess at this point i would defer that i think to pure sky we we've uh you know we've lost a few panels here here and there so I, I don't know the exact output at this point if that's the, is that the sizing the the megawatt output you're looking for or the num or yeah. number of panels the megawatt output yeah yes steve let me let me check the nameplate rating on the on the title block one moment please okay I'm pretty sure it was listed in um, one of the documents that was received by the board, Mr. Chair. I think it was in the the battery storage system narrative. I think it went down to like 9.37 megawatts or something like that. Oh, I have a 9.267 megawatts. Yes. That, that sounds about right. That's the correct number? Yes. That's, yeah, that would be the DC size. Yeah. Okay. And four point, no, and... 4.4 4 AC, is that correct? Yes, that, that also sounds correct, yeah. All right, so um, that's- and the, and the battery storage system is what size? It was, um, it was uh, four hours. I believe it's dropped down to two hours, two megawatt hours. So let me also just confirm that for you folks as well. Yeah, that's what I read here. I believe that was also brought up at a previous meeting, Mr. Chair, back in January. Um, I think they talked about cutting back because the, um, I guess the system didn't need 
the original four megawatt hours. I'm just this is just me recollecting information that was discussed at previous meetings. Of course, the applicant can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's to my knowledge what I remember. Yeah, we did downsize it because um, we we didn't need to export um, that much power to the grid. We using the battery, um, so. I, I just I, I want to give you guys the right numbers though, and they have changed since we um, we did drop the panel count. So um, while I'm looking for that, I'm happy to answer other questions. Let's uh, while you look for that, let's go to Ms. Brestra. She has her hand up. Oh, I just noticed one other thing, and I think Erin Jacques brought it up when she was talking to me and Mr. Wachilla, and that is that the. Um, the roadway, the access road has changed um, its course, not the gravel road, but the road that is, I guess it's hard packed earth. So yes. that um, the route of that road has changed since you submitted something to us earlier in this project. That's all, I don't have a question about it. I just wanted to point that out to you. Okay, me. yep, that was, that was as a, a reaction to the two new uh, wetlands that were uh, popped up through the continual process. Uh, so we had to move that through uh, to try and offset those two wetlands the best best way possible to just to have a pathway through there to, to construct the project. Yeah, well, just to elaborate on what Steve was saying, um, the wetland in front of you, the um, 5S-106, um, that 5S wetland, Steve, if you don't mind um, putting your cursor over on top of that one. Yeah, so that was, and Tom, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's a state regulated wetland. Um, those are, we, we really didn't want to encroach on that at all. So we decided to move um, it, it, because as you'll previously recall, the access road was wrapping around the buffer zone for that and then connecting to the turnaround um, just past the equipment pad. So we we decided to move shift that to the west um, to kind of straddle the two buffer zones of those two new wetlands in the center of the of the array of the array um and it is 40 feet from um the from the actual wetland to the edge of the road and it's really an you know an earthen packed uh access road so we just really didn't want to encroach on that state regulated wetland and we we thought you know this would be the widest path where it would do you know the most minimal amount of impact um just on the buffer for those two um, amherst regulated wetlands Anything else, Ms. Brestrup? Put your hands up. Just there we go. All right. Um, Mr. Loss, so yes. you were, you were, is that pretty much the, what you were wish to present or do you have more to tell us about the changes? In yeah, no, I, that, that's pretty good overview of what, uh, what has changed here? I, I'll take questions, but I don't. Yeah, I don't really have anything else more to to offer till we, you know, we look forward to going through the peer review process and and uh, you know getting into the details at that point. All right, Mr. Reedy, do you have anything else to present? No, that's it, Mr. Chair. Thanks. All right. Members of the board have questions. It seems a lot of this for us, we'll, the peer review will have, um, will identify issues and questions more and there may be further changes. So, I mean, are any questions right now are really sort of top line questions. Um, and right. if there are none, there are no further top line questions, we can move on to public comment if that's what um, unless there are other board members' questions. Makes sense. Thank you. Whoops. Somehow I just lost, I lost my screen for a second. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. No, hold on. Yes, we can. Oh, well, there we go. Now I'm, I'm back for whatever reason. That's good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 
that, that was, yeah, um, which is gone for a bit. Um, it was probably I needed battery storage to keep that from, from happening. All right. Um, if there are no other comments from board members, this is a, an opportunity for public comment. Um, Mr. Wachilla, I note that we have, what do you, since we have 24 people yes. in attendance. That's correct, 24. 24 people in attendance. Um, so uh, we got a large number of people here. Um, if you wish to speak, please so indicate by using the raised hand function on your Zoom application or by pressing star nine on your phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will recognize people who wish to speak. When recognized, please state your name and address for the record. All comments should be addressed to the board. Please limit your comments to about three minutes. The chair will start a timer to assist you in keeping that time, keeping to that time limit. If your comment is similar to a previous comment, please consider just stating your name and address and state that your position is similar to a prior commentor. By doing so, the board will be cognizant of the fact that there are several people who hold a similar position and has the same effect as repeating the earlier stated position. So we will note that. We'll know that you share a position with somebody else. And that the added benefit of giving more people a chance to speak on this matter as I stated before, the board is going to hold a lot of public hearings on this, or several public hearings on this matter, and we'll be taking co public comment at all public hearings. So I guess what I'd like to do is start off going through with, um, you identify the, the person who first raised their hand, Rob, and when you do, please give your name. When you're recognized, please give your name and address uh, for the record and make your comments to the board. So, Thank Mr. You. Chair, it looks like the first person to raise their hand, um, Fleetwood Environmental Solutions. That was the company I referenced um, yep. the report sent to us earlier. So they should be able to unmute themselves and speak to the board. Can you folks hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is David Cameron. I'm with Fleetwood Environmental Solutions, LLC, 84 Russell Street in Hadley. And I'm attending this meeting on behalf of Jenny Kalick and Robert Brazuka, who are downgrading a butter to the project. Um, I believe that the board was provided with a peer or a third party review report that I submitted to the Conservation Commission several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I went into a lot of detail about projects like this in that letter. Um, I would open up by um, adding on to Attorney Reedy's comments. Attorney Reedy was talking about the, the ANRAD and ORAD process, and I don't know how familiar the board is with how that works, but that is kind of the preliminary planning phase for a project like this. It's establishing the wetland boundaries, the legal wetland boundaries, just so that everybody agrees on where those boundaries are. And the next step, if any work is proposed within um, the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission, whether it's under the Wetlands Protection Act or the Town of Amherst Wetlands Bylaw, that's a notice of intent process. So that that will still have to play out. Um, in that report that I submitted to the Commission several weeks ago, I noted that constructing projects like this on landforms like this can be very challenging. They're not insurmountable, but they have inherent challenges. When you're clearing forested hillsides, significant acreage, management of stormwater during the construction phase is absolutely critical. Um, and um, I, unfortunately, I, I have a lot of experience with this because I've been in an enforcement, I've, I've worked on projects like this in an enforcement capacity and arguably have more experience dealing with water quality violations associated with projects like this than perhaps anybody else in the Commonwealth. So I know how these projects can go off the rails if they're not designed and more importantly, constructed properly. So um, getting a, a very competent peer review civil and environmental engineer with demonstrated stormwater design experience and specifically experience dealing with these types of projects in a remedial fashion is probably very important for the board to consider. Um, 
I do know that according to the latest plans, it looks like the applicant has pulled almost everything out of the 100 foot buffer zone uh, for the project. And I, I have to say, I really commend the project proponent for doing that. That's um, uh, that's very admirable. And it's a, it's a great show of good faith on behalf of the project proponent. That means they took, they've taken our comments very seriously and they, they, they seem to understand what the inherent risks are in a project like this. So I commend them for that. Um, my clients have encouraged me to offer my technical experience to the board since I've dealt with a lot of projects like this. And so I would offer that up if at any point the board wants to contact me directly to get input on how these projects tend to go, you can feel free to do that. And I think that's all I have. Great. Thank you. Who's the next person we have, Mr. Wachilla? Um, and forgive me if I mispronounce your last name, Eric Bacharach. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, coming Great. through loud and clear. Thank you so much. I just want to point out first that- just give us your, Before you start, just give us your address, Mr. Bach. Of course. It's Eric Backrack, uh, 277 Shootsbury Road at Amherst. And I want you to uh, first mention that I did send a letter to be and asked to be included in the uh, members of the ZBA's packets on April 19th and received a letter back from uh, Ms. Brestrop indicating that the she will uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, include it in the uh, ZBA packet, and I did not, and I'm concerned because I did not hear that it was included um, because it did come from uh, myself regarding this project. Um, uh, I just want let me read the statement that I've I've written for uh, to just to be concise here. If permitted by the ZBA, the Shootsbury Road Solar Project will be the single largest project of its kind, and likely the only project ever of this magnitude to be seen in Amherst. This is a huge and environmentally very challenging project, and it is being undertaken by a company that has been sloppy throughout the application process and throughout the nearly five years it has been active. Just look, at the just look at the voluminous project application and if you follow it through, you'll see countless red line areas, crossed out dates, more crossed out passages, references to the AMP energy in many places. That is to say that if Pure Sky can submit a clean and coherent application, what will the project look like? This project, project has enormous and irreparable environmental damage implications. By clear cutting 42 acres of forest land, we have eliminated any potential natural water absorption provided by the forest and soil. What likelihood is there of water runoff control after 42 acres, 31 football fields worth have been stripped to the ground? The project is on a to topographically downward sloping terrain. What will happen to the Adams Brook, the Fort River watershed, and Amherst public and private drinking water supplies? We just don't know. In 2019, Dr. Raymond Bradley of UMass's Northeast Climate Science Center said, quote, that our storms have more energy and frequency, and this will only increase. Much of the precipitation will be in the in winter and early spring. Groundwater is at the surface, which means additional water from storms will be more likely to flood downstream given the high water table. The ZBA is taking on a project the likes of which has never been seen before in Amherst, but we can point to other similar projects elsewhere that have had disastrous outcomes. I'm asking the ZBA to study this project carefully, employ objective, non-biased peer reviewers and experts in the field to test the veracity of Pure Sky's application assumptions, and to please, please look at this project from a 360 degree perspective and will require comprehensive environmental impact studies 
and examine thoroughly the inherent risks of the project. It will be too late for future regret regrets after the damage is done and the forests and wetlands are destroyed. Please take the time that a project of this magnitude demands before permitting it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Backrack. You're welcome. Thank you. And we'll, um, I'm, I'm sure that your um, comment will be, we've asked that your comment will be included in the next. It actually, Mr. Chair, was included in your packet. I forgot to mention that to you, but uh, there was a letter from April 19th, 2024, sent from Eric Backrack. So it might have been missed when you were announcing it earlier on, but it is in the digital packet that the board has access to. Yep. Um, so the next public comment is going to be from Judy Eisman of the Pelham Planning Board. Yes, hello. This is Judith Eisman. I live at 88 Arnold Road in Pelham. And I'm offering these comments on behalf of the Pelham Planning Board uh, and others in Pelham who are strongly opposed to this project. I will email lengthier comments following this hearing as I did uh, in December 2023 when I forwarded information about current science and reports from private, public, and governmental studies. You did not mention that uh, those public comments, but I will resend them if you have misplaced or don't have them. Um, sadly, I have firsthand knowledge of the dangers of a poorly designed and monitored solar project. My son and his wife were the victims of a poor stormwater management plan in Williamsburg on their property adjacent to the Mill River and Devil's Den. Several tons of earth washed down onto about 10 acres of their property and damaged forest, wetlands, the river ecosystem, and their peace of mind for several years, while a variety of attempts to restore the area made some things even worse. Ultimately, after those responsible failed to comply with assorted violations, rep reparations, and a DEP enforcement order, a federal court consent degree filed by then Attorney General Maura Healy was settled for $1.14 million. The latest scientific studies and evidence scream for denial of a project of this magnitude in an area zoned outlying residential, and which includes a large area of wetland forests of high quality, <clears throat> vital to the interests of Amherst, Pelham, and Shutesbury, as well as the region. Certainly industrial scale solar has a place as we face a long delayed response to climate change. However, that does not mean that solar or, or other energy production types should be located where they will in fact do damage. Clinging to outdated assumptions, scientific find findings and opinions is no help here. Not only is this area inappropriate for such an industrial use, but the main question actually is whether the cutting of trees for industrial solar panels is in furtherance of state policy. Clearly, it is not. The changes in the DOER SMART, that's Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target Program, uh, and the guidelines of SMART, make it clear that, uh, make that clear that cutting trees is not a good idea. And Climate Chief Melissa Hoffer often repeats uh, a, a state makes a statement to the effect that net zero equals increases in electricity infrastructure plus more carbon sequestration. Cutting down trees does not further carbon sequestration. Further, nature-based solutions are being promoted by the state's municipal vulnerability program. And remember that solar panels are fossil fuel based with all the attendant problems having to do with eventual pollution and, and uh, other kinds of uh, replacement needs that require, again, fossil fuels. Building solar is a stopgap, not a solution to climate change. And surely, surely someone can locate a better site. Amherst has already permitted large solar projects elsewhere, and this one is a disaster in the making. Why would the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals go along with something that neither benefits the town nor the state's well-being and may in fact cause irreversible damage to soils, water, and the area's capacity to sequester carbon, to sequester carbon, I'm sorry, while demanding while damaging wildlife cores and habitat in Amherst, Pelham, and Shutesbury. To the extent that the town of Amherst thinks it must do its part to assist with combating climate change and 
cleaner energy use, I implore you to approve another project, not this one. Don't be fooled by questionable science or ignore the motivations involved. Mr. Eisman, could you uh, kind of wrap up your four minutes? One more sentence. Two, too often environmental costs are not adequately described in the rush to get things built. We are running out of environmental resources to balance against housing needs, various desires, and corporate greed. Nature is not just an amenity separate from humanity, and it's time we take that fact seriously. Thank you. All right, so next we have uh, Michael Lipinski. Uh, I'm Michael Lipinski, 167 Shutesbury Road in the Amherst. But before I begin my public comments, I just want to mention that there was a serious omission on that map that was shown earlier. It does not show a newly identified wetland at the entrance to the project with a 100 foot buffer around it. I don't know if they dropped that off the map on purpose or if it's an accident, but that is part of the new uh, ANRAD map. And they didn't even show the entrance on the screen. And I think that's a serious omission that I'd like someone to address before I begin my comments. Mr. Lipinski, um, will those things can be addressed after the comment period? If, okay. If that would be just as good, just as well. Just make a note of it. That's, because yep. it was it that's was the, pretty, it was pretty blatant. It's that's the um, option of the presenter if they want to address. Okay, that. thank you. you. Proceed. Okay, so uh, last, last October, members of the planning board asked Pure Sky to provide them with examples of previously completed solar projects that were similar to the proposed Shutesbury Road facility. They did not do that. On April 17th, Corey from Pure Skies submitted a document to the ZBA titled Pure Sky Energy Historical Project Outline. This document features a single example from a fairly recent solar project on 179 Adams Road in East Brookfield, Massachusetts. Unfortunately, it is not at all comparable to the Shutesbury Road site under consideration. It's not clear if Pure Sky really believes that the Adams Road site is comparable, or more likely, just hoping that no one on the ZBA panel will question their example. Why are these two sites not compatible? Well, let's start with Shutesbury Road. 41 acres of disturbance. That's 41 acres of trees brought to the ground, grubbed, you know the routine by now. The Adams Road site, 21 acres of disturbance, half the size. The Shutesbury Road site, 100% forest. The Adams Road site, approximately 50% of that site was open fields. The other 50% was trees. Shutesbury Road has over a dozen well cared for homes directly abutting the project. There's people who live there who take pride in their homes and their natural setting. Many of these homes still house the original occupants. So in many ways, it's a mature neighborhood. But over the years, we've had some new families arrive, many of them with children. Adams Road. Pure Sky laughably said that the neighbors did not seem to have any complaints about the project. Well, I took a field trip there. And here's what I saw. Let me paint a picture for you. Across the street from this project is a beautiful old white farmhouse with a per perfectly formed old maple tree in front of it. Next to that house is a large red and white sign saying, coming soon, American Industries, aggregate asphalt excavation. The entire side of the, uh, of the site on the other side of the road is going to become an aggregate asphalt excavation site. The people who lived in that house are long gone. The, the, uh, the site right now is already under construction. It's basically just driveways and equipment and the kind of things you'd expect to see on a, on a fledgling excavation site. Down the road on the same side as the actual solar plant, downstream from the solar plant, 
is an area littered with construction equipment. It's an excavation site. Sand and gravel contains uh, the sorting equipment for uh, sorting sand and gravel from for an operation. You, you know what those big slides are, and you know that the type of machines that are there, and the type of noise and dust that that produces. And to even top it off, just down from that is a cement plant. Those are the neighbors to this particular facility. So Mr. Filipinski, <laughs> we're running up on four minutes. Can you wrap it up? I'm not, I'm not even close to done. I'd like about two more minutes. You know, we, we, everybody's In other in, words, it's a everybody's about, th about three minutes. And you're at four minutes and 20 seconds. So kind of wrap it up. Give us your main points. There'll be other opportunities to My speak. main point is the comparison that they're making is not true. It's not even close to true. And yet they're trying to slide it in as a true statement. Here's my closing so I don't lose that. I would urge you to require Pier Sky to reveal the problems and complaints generated by their facilities in other towns that they did not choose for comparison, especially issues that occurred during construction. The lesson to be learned here is that the ZBA needs to take the time to do a slow, deliberate examination of every document and every aspect of this project, something that has definitely not happened to date. This is a complex project being proposed for an environmentally sensitive, inappropriate location. Please treat Thank it you. as such. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Um, so is there next person? So next person is uh, Lenore Brick. Hi, everybody. Um, this will be under three minutes. All right. Just start with your, then start with your name and address, please. Yes, Lenore, Lenore Bricks, Strong Street, Amherst. And thank you all for your good, thorough work. Without any disrespect to everyone involved that's just trying to do their jobs well, my comments are viewing the vision and purpose for this project through a big picture lens and challenging the fundamental wisdom of these kinds of solar projects. Unfortunately, there's not been enough understanding about how natural systems have always regulated the climate and how intact ecosystems like forests are critical to mitigate the disastric, effect, disastric effects of our current climate catastrophe. Even though the current Healy administration has outlined climate goals that, that highlight restoring soil health and protecting green lands like forests, restoring soil health, um, I'm sorry, there, rem there re still remains archaic legislation and regulatory processes, a lack of an integrated regional approach, short-sighted policies and subsidy programs that have been funding projects like this across the state, an inefficient lack of oversight, all of that so that we're crippled with fragmented governance, leaving our local town boards and committees, you guys, to have the foresight, courage, and clarity to do the right thing for our public personal and planetary health. As you know, because something's legal doesn't mean it's right, because something's right in theory or in certain places doesn't make it right in practice or in every place. There's a wealth of current resources, if you need more, that we at Climate Action Now can offer you, including academic papers, lectures, articles, websites, that clearly make the case that installing large industrial solar plants on any land that we need to protect water quality and supply, soil integrity, biodiversity to help prevent impacts of the flooding, droughts, increasing heat, that's all only getting worse as we all know, is the wrong course of action to address the mess that we find ourselves in, basically because of our disconnect with nature and our colonial traditional economies based on resource extraction. We urge you to please do everything in your power and in your conscience to make the right decisions. Thank you for all your good work. Thank you, Ms. Brick. Um, Mr. Wachilla, who's next? So we have a Scott Cashin. Thank you. Scott Cashin, I live at 21 Hotbrook Road in Amherst, and I'm a biologist with 17 years of professional experience evaluating the environmental impacts of industrial scale solar projects. At the Conservation Commission meeting, a member of the public commented that small world pagonia occurs at the project site. 
This plant species is not only federally listed as endangered and state listed as threatened, but it is one of the rarest plants in the entire Northeast ecoregion. To the best of my knowledge, there haven't been any surveys to document the presence of rare plant and animal species at the project site. Without survey data, it is impossible for the public and ZBA <laughs> to understand the true environmental impacts of the project, and as importantly, to formulate mitigation to minimize the project's impacts on the natural environment. Plant surveys need to be conducted at the project site. The surveys should occur throughout the blooming period and they should be floristic in nature, meaning every species is identified to the level necessary to determine rarity. In addition, the plant survey should be conducted by an independent third party botanist or if conducted by the applicant's consultants, the survey methods and results should be peer reviewed. A couple comments with respect to wildlife. The site plans show quote unquote amphibian enhancements around wetlands that would insert would be encircled by project infrastructure. What amphibian species would these enhancements benefit? Based on the applicant's natural resources inventory, there have not been any efforts to inventory the full suite of amphibians or other wildlife tax at the project site. While amphibian enhancements might seem like a good idea, they could have negative impacts depending on the species that occur at the site. Surveys to document the amphibians and other wildlife taxa that occur at the project site need to be conducted. The applicant's natural resources inventory identifies the possibility that the federally and state listed long-eared bat could occur at the project site. However, there haven't been any surveys to determine if this species does indeed occur at the project site. Bat surveys are essential to understanding the project's impacts and in formulating appropriate mitigation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cashin. So, um, next, so next we have uh, Phil Rich. Okay. Phil Rich, can you hear me okay? Yep. Phil Rich, 187 Shootsbury Road, Amherst. Uh, I'm the person right, right next to the access road. The access road comes in at my mailbox. So just to be really clear, uh, and, and a number of neighbors have already spoken. Uh, I'm the neighbor most neighborly, however. Um, I'm concerned already uh, about flooding here. My basement flooded just a year ago because of that downhill run. That's just the normal run. For, I've talked to the town for years about what gets washed down the road uh, that comes across my driveway and has eroded the driveway and eroded the, the, and this is just the existing. 50 feet from my house, excuse me, 50 yards from my house, um, we're going to have years and years of, of drive, of, of path rather, torn up. So I, I'm concerned about, and I want to be clear, and I think this is true for all of the neighbors, we've mentioned already kind of the downhill uh, uh, geology here, excuse me, geography here. But uh, I'm one of those people right in line. So I have concerns as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, a citizen of the town about property values, about noise pollution, about um, uh, flooding, about drainage, about erosion. All of these things, at least in terms of erosion and flooding, are already the case for me. So I think that's one thing that I want to be really clear on as a direct abutter. Uh, secondly, I would be very uh, concerned uh, with respect to the, who the peer reviewer uh, is going to be uh, selected by and, and who gets to put that the, those names on the list. I would formally request that it has nothing to do with and in fact isn't even revealed to uh, the applicant team or anybody related to the applicant team so that it really is truly an independent reviewer. Uh, I doubt there's that many reviewers in the state so I imagine that, the, that they're, not, they're not that far removed but I would be very concerned about that because the whole point here is to ensure that commercial interests for a commercial property aren't really rationalized by all the things that we're hearing in light of all the other things that we're hearing about the potentially irreversible damage. I think that's all I really want to say, just speaking directly, uh, uh, I guess, from my own personal experience and my own heart about this. So thank you very much. And I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rich. Um, so well. we have... Um... A few more hands up, Mr. Chair. So the next person we have is uh, Jenny Kalick. Thank you very much, everybody, for your work tonight. I want to touch on... Just give us your name and address, Ms. Kalick, before we... Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Kalick, 
147 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to touch upon the, in your packet, there's material from the planning board. Uh, as Ms. Bestrup commented, we've got the minutes, we've got a summary memo, we've got materials that were requested by the planning board. When the planning board met uh, on October 6th, they didn't have peer reviewers, uh, but they had uh, several hours of very sincere questions that they posed. Many of them were not answered to the degree that the planning board said, we can't say to the ZBA, we recommend this project. Quite the contrary. We may want to see it again. We, we have many questions. It is so complicated. We would like to be kept apprised of it. And after our October 6th meeting, we wanted immediately our minutes, the summary board and all the materials transferred and in the hands of the ZBA as they started to think about this project. Uh, this material is in your packet today because as I looked for those materials, I discovered none of them had been generated. I asked Chris to please do the minutes the minutes were done six months after the meeting. I asked for the memo. It was done six months after the meeting. And none of you had the opportunity to hear the in-depth presentation and discussion of your uh, fellow companion board with a great deal of insight and many, many questions. All that material is now in your board. So the in your packet, now we have a problem, don't we? The procedures are upside down here. We're we're at the end of April. There's no ORAD yet. Um, and yet the applicant is saying, just sit back and wait till the peer reviewer tells you what to think about. Whereas the planning board said, here are many, many important questions. We pass them to you and let's be in communication as we go forward. So I think we have a major flaw in the beginning of how this project came to you, what you've had available to you to think about and to study. Uh, just as an example, a couple of the comments uh, tonight, Mr. Cashin talked about concern about species. All of that was brought up at the planning board. Uh, Mr. Lipinski talked about this example that was brought up actually in the planning board. Phasing, which you all talked about uh, back in October, uh, if you look at the, the uh, phasing document, it, there are some changes, but uh, it starts out with cutting down all the trees all at once in what's called pre-construction. That was a worry to the planning board. It was worry to the CONCOM. It's in the uh, minutes that you got and the document you got from Aaron Jacques. And yet we're sitting here and kind of being led by the applicant to think that what's going to happen is hurry up and get a peer reviewer. Regarding Mr. Rich's comment, the peer reviewer for the who has already been hired is the firm WSP uh, through a public records Search, I have seen the documents. Mr. Reedy all has worked with WSP through B Blue Wave. Uh, Chris has already told us that WSP worked on Sunderland Road, which also Mr. Reedy worked on. There is the appearance of a conflict of interest. WSP does not seem appropriate for an application that is led by attorney Reedy and it, they have already been selected for one part of it. Uh, Ms. Kellogg, we're at four minutes here, so. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's write the, the process. Let's make sure that we look at things in an orderly fashion. Let's not have the applicant lead us through this very, very important uh, process of knowing what's at stake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kellogg. Mr. Wachilla, who's next? We've got two more, I see. 
Yes, and Mr. Chair, um, can I offer my comment in response to to Ms. Kalick's point after our last after two comments? The, okay. We'll 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 do that after public comment. Okay, thank you. So the next person we have is Renee Moss. Hi, good evening. My name is Renee Moss, and I live at two seven seven Shootsbury Road. Um, I before I even start, I have a question for you. I see, and maybe it's my screen. I see only two people from the ZBA on my screen. I only see Steve Judge and Craig Meadows. Is every uh, is is oh okay? And is Everett Henry there too? I was just wondering if we still had the quorum. You, you got everybody here. Okay, I'm sorry. It's just that. For some reason, I, that's all I saw. Okay. Um, yes. You know, um, when uh, Mr. Judge start, started the meeting and talked about the charge of the ZBA, you talked about promoting the health, safety, and welfare of residents. And I think that's why we're all here tonight. Um, I want to just say and not repeat what's been said before that, that I agree you know, wholeheartedly, passionately with everything that has been said so far. And I, I hope you're hearing our public comments loud and clear. This is this is a group of abutters and a group of people other than abutters in the community who have all been doing so much research, spending so much time studying this and, you know, um, wanting to to protect the health, safety and welfare of the people of Amherst. Um, one of the things that has um, come up for me in seeing the new plan is that we we are looking at a delineation for the 40 acres, the 31 football field worth of forest that is being taken down. But this is a 102 acre parcel. And I'm concerned that when we create a project that is so, um, that has such magnitude, what happens to those other 60 acres? What happens to the, and if we, if we haven't, um, if we haven't delineated them, do we know if there are wetlands just beyond that border and what happens with the stormwater plan? How does it affect, how does it affect that 60 acres that we haven't even looked at, that we don't even know what's there? We don't know what the endangered species is there. We don't know what the what the wetland situation is there. So um, that concerns me that um, that those other 60 acres are, are unknown and how, how it will be affected by uh, a project of this magnitude. Um, I think I just want to urge you, as everybody else has has before me, please proceed proceed slowly, carefully. Get the right peer reviewers. Please don't do something that creates irreparable damage. Um, and basically, that's all I have to say. And I want to thank you for your work. And I'm sure this is a very difficult project for the ZBA. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you taking your time and doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Uh, our last public commenter is uh, Stacy, I think, Rob. Yep. Hi, I'm Stacy McCullough. I live at 26 North Valley in Pelham. Um, I'm also a member of the Pelham Planning Board. I am in substantial agreement with many of the commenters who have expressed concerns about the potential damage from this project. Um, when you consider the many acres of trees that are going to be cut, the desiccation of the soil, the eliminating of the habitats, the um, endangering of the um, groundwater and potentially the water supply. I think to weigh against that, um, you have to say, okay, that's all related to health, safety, and well-being, but so is uh, climate change. And we certainly do need to transition to solar. And so the question becomes, can we do that? Can we meet our energy goals, and those are also about health, safety, and well-being, without causing the kinds of damage that this project inevitably will cause. And um, our region has been really at the forefront of um, pushing for those energy goals. We need to be net zero. It was going to be 2050. We pushed to do it by 2045, and now that's the goal. Our senators and representatives have been aligned about that, and they are similarly aligned 
now that they have done studies, that doing that does not require sites like this one. They've commissioned studies. There have been studies at the state level by Harvard Forest, by Audubon. The experts in these areas have treated as, as an open question, saying, can we meet our climate goals, our ambitious climate result goals? Can we get to net zero by 2045 without clear-cutting forest or solar? The answer is a resounding yes. If you look at those reports, there is absolutely no need to cut down sensitive areas, which right now are the first on the chopping block. If you make them last on the chopping block, we still have plenty of places that solar can be installed. And that's in the reports that I really would encourage you to track down because those reports are currently shifting state policy and subsidies. And the faster that the applicant tries to push, the more you need to be aware that part of the reason is that they're um, going to be no longer subsidized in the same way for places as biodiverse and as sensitive of this one. So please consider the direction that policy will be going and the reports that it's based on that came out of places like Audubon and Harvard Forestry, along with the state itself. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Mr. Wachilla, I think that's all we have for public comment. I see no other hands up. You're correct, Mr. Chair. We're looking at 731. So what I'd like to do is two things before we take a short five minute break. Uh, I want to give the applicant the, the chance to rebut or to uh, respond to any comments. And I know you have a comment you want to make regarding one of the comments, which may be more appropriate to make during the public meeting on, on, a, on a, the um, peer reviewers. So um, let's go to the, have the um, applicant respond if they so choose to any of the, the public comments. Sure, Mr. Chair, thanks. Um, I mean, I think we can let the process play out and respond in time. We agree with selecting the right peer reviewer. We agree with taking it slow and meticulous. Like that's what we're here for. Um, maybe one comment to, I think it was Mr. Lipinski um, with what I would characterize as maybe suggesting we were being deceptive and in not including a certain um, wetland on our plan. Uh, we're going to, we have to go through an NOI. I think he's referencing an off-site resource area uh, at the entrance. Um, it's not part of our ORAD because it can't be part of our ORAD because it's not on our site. And so um, that there is, uh, from my, my understanding, the Conservation Commission, through a um, request for determination of applicability, found a resource area southerly of the access drive. And so we will have to go through a notice of intent process for work proximate to that resource area. So absolutely nothing deceptive here. Um, that's part of what we're going to be going through in the process. Um, one last thing before we go to break, are there members of the board who have additional questions of the applicant? All right, if not, um, it's 7.33, we'll take a five minute break and come back at 7.38. Um, and at that point, we will um, go to the public, enter a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open for the discussion of the peer review. All right, um, see you all in five minutes at 7.38. Here. Great, uh, we're back at 7.39. Um, at this point, we've done, we've had the presentation, we've had public comment, we've had the ability for the, um, the petitioner to respond to the public comment and uh, for board members to ask any final questions. I would now entertain a motion to move to a public meeting on this matter while keeping the public hearing open. Do I have so moved? Is there a second? Moved and second. Any discussion? My intent is to deal with uh, peer review, some motions to deal with peer review. If there's no, no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. 
Mr. Sloboder. Aye. Vote is four to nothing. We're in a public meeting. The public meeting is where the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. Um, tonight we have two motions before us that we really uh, deal with peer review. The first is, uh, and I think if we wish to do peer review, what we really need to do is to authorize the staff, number one, to issue an RFP regarding those subject matters which we have identified in a previous meeting we wanted to have pre peer review on, and then to also authorize the staff to in, once to evaluate those RFPs and to engage in a contract with the peer review of their choice um, as, as through the rules that for the rules of the ZBA. So um, I think probably it'd be valuable if either Ms. Brestrup or Mr. Wachilla would just give us a brief background on the, the process you use for doing an RFP and how you select a, a peer reviewer. And I guess, and also real briefly, the top, how the topics were chosen. I think that's because we chose those topics at the last board meeting, but that was a while ago and people may forget. So Ms. Brestrup, do you want to take that? I think it would be appropriate if Mr. Wachilla um, took okay. that and I will add things if I think they needed okay. to be added, okay? That would be great. Sure, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So basically how we do peer review is that, um, we would draft what's called a request for proposals. And basically that is a document that outlines the tasks of what we require from the peer reviewer. Um, so for the first round that we submitted, it was for the topics of um, solar glare study and battery storage energy systems. Um, and, you know, we did advertise that as such. Uh, the zoning board did authorize staff to start the peer review process, which means that, you know, you allowed for us to go ahead and start drafting these RFPs to solicit proposals from potential peer reviewers, which is what we did. And we did this back in January. Um, so we let that process stay open for about three to four weeks. Um, usually that gives people enough time to see our solicitation. They'll draft the proposal and then they'll send something back to us. And usually what they send back to us is, uh, you know, a, a background of what they're going to do. They'll give experience of what they did uh, professionally, um, past experience at other towns, previous projects, et cetera. And then usually they'll include staff who are going to work on those projects and their relevant experience and qualifications, et cetera. So when we did get responses back, we only got responses back from one firm, WSP. And uh, as Ms. Kalig mentioned, they did work on a different project for battery storage back in July of last year for a company known as Blue Wave. Um, so along with that proposal, all consultants are also required to submit a conflict of interest statement, which means that they can prove or they state to us directly that they have no direct conflict of interest with the applicants. So at this point, WSP does not have a direct conflict of interest with Pure Sky because they historically have not worked on any recent projects together. And to my knowledge, no projects within the past five to 10 years at all. So that is why, and since they were the only person that responded to the RFP, we went ahead and, and signed a contract with them. So that was the error of staff because the zoning board is actually the authority that chooses the peer reviewer. So that's one of the reasons why the first motion is to come to you as the board. And mind you, we have paused any work with them. So we have not done anything since February. I mean, the only thing we did was just meet with them one time to go over the project and that's it. Um, so that first vote is going to authorize us staff to go mm -hmm. ahead and to work with um, WSP on the bar battery storage and the glare study aspect of the peer review. The other thing that has to be done is you as board have to decide if you want us as staff to go ahead and start the second round, which includes the topics of construction, um, phasing, the site plans, and water quality. And we're going to group all those together into one big peer review and then do the same thing over again and hope that we get solicitations back for that. So I do see two hands up for Mr. Henry and Mr. Mills. I don't know if you had questions about what I said specifically. Yeah, I do. Just, just, just one. Mm -hmm. Did you say there was only one company that bid for this first peer review? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and for the for the construction part of it, do we have more than one bids? So we haven't actually. Um, so we did back in late January 
submit an RFP for the second peer review that I mentioned, but nobody responded to us after four weeks at all. So we're going to have to resubmit that after the board authorizes us as staff to do so. So when we submitted the first round, which is just the solar and the battery storage, one firm, that was it. When we as staff submitted the second round to see if anybody would actually get back to us, nobody applied at all. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And we're hoping that since it's getting to be around April and May, firms may have more time for these types of peer reviews. So that's kind of where we're at right now. My, and my other question is <clears throat> to prevent delays mm -hmm. in, in what we're voting for now. Yes. Could we vote to say that we will defer to you guys when you get their bids back to just choose the best option? That's, that would be the motion. Yes. Okay. To authorize the staff to contract with the, the peer review. And also, okay. I want to add to that, um, Mr. Henry. So that's a good question. And usually staff works independently on hiring and vetting these peer review um, consultants that submit proposals to us. We'll look for one that we think is the most qualified, one that has the least amount of conflict at all. Uh, staff, I'm sorry, a consultant that we believe can do a thorough and effective job on these types of reviews. So that's that's essentially where given the responsibility to us to do. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Meadows. I, I guess I've got a couple of comments. Um, you know, I, I put out a lot of RRPs. Mm -hmm. And if we only get one response, we do not take that. We go back out again. And we go directly to recommended consultants and try to encourage them to participate. So I would feel very uncomfortable if there's only one selected uh, consultant for peer review because they were, and they were selected because they were the only ones applying. Secondly, with WSP, I, I, I have full faith in Mr. Reedy and probably WSP, but uh, uh, any seeming appearance of conflict is is inappropriate for us to hire a company with. And while I, you know, as I say, my confidence in Mr. Reedy and probably what WSP, I don't know them at all. I, I, one, they're the only, only reply. Secondly, there's the possibility that there's an appearance of conflict. And we, we shouldn't go along with that. Secondly, we had some good comments tonight about uh, from Mr. Cashin about including a plant survey, an amphibian survey, and a bat survey. And I think those comments should be taken with a great deal of interest, and we should include those in either a, a separate peer review for those uh, or somehow included in the overall. Although I doubt that the you're going to get the same kind of response for someone who's looking at construction as you would getting someone who does a bad survey. Uh, so I think all of that should be taken into consideration. Mr. Chair, can I answer Mr. Meadows' uh, concerns and questions? Yes. So we did reach out to four firms before we submitted that first RFP, Craig, regarding the mm -hmm. battery storage and the solar glare study. Um, reputable firms in, in those fields. And WSP was one of those fields, actually, that we reached out to as well to get an idea of how much it's going to cost for a firm like that to do that type of project. We aggregate all that data and we sent out the RFP and they happened to be the only firm that replied to us. What makes us as staff comfortable in selecting them is due to their qualifications of working on the Blue Wave project, which is a much larger battery storage project. And they also proved to us that they've worked on other larger battery storage projects as well. So just from qualifications alone, us as staff felt comfortable making the determination that they have a high level of expertise in citing and developing these types of projects. Um, I do understand the concern that only one peer reviewer submitting an RFP could be concerning. 
I just think in the situation for us as staff and Chris, you can jump in here if I'm kind of going off the path a little bit. I mean, it did not make us feel uncomfortable because we, we knew they had the qualifications already. Um, and usually if one firm replies back, it could be a firm that doesn't have a lot of experience, a firm that's just trying to get their foot in the door to do these types of projects to build up their resume. So I, I get the concern where you're coming from. And to the conflict of interests um, discussion that was brought up. So we did speak with our talent attorney about this specifically. We asked them and said, Tom Reedy worked with Blue Wave and WSP was engineering firm for that company. And now he's representing Pure Sky for this project. And town council did not really express a lot of concern to us about that being a major issue to the point where we can't go forward with WSP as our peer review consultants. He said the most important connection appearance conflict of interest outright is the conflict of interest between WSP and Pure Sky directly, to which there is none. And Chris, you can jump in here if I'm not fully covering everything that was discussed with with our attorney, but that was the gist of what we got. And that is the reason why we are considering moving forward with WSP if the board authorizes us to do so. Thank you. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, Mr. Sloviter. Yeah, just to understand the RFP process, is it normal to only get <clears throat> one response? And is it because we're a smaller town or where we are or we're not in Boston or why, why are there so few firms that we can even approach? It's a good question. So there's several reasons. Um, the one that if you submit an RFP earlier in the year, that's when a lot of big firms are getting projects at their doorstep. So a lot of those firms don't really have the time allocated to doing a peer review. They're trying to focus on doing the other projects that bring business to their organization. There's also, if you make the peer review seem too small and specific, that drives away a lot of firms as well. So just to make a correction, the second round of peer review that we RFP'd after the solar actually wasn't the big broader topic that I was talking about. It was just water quality. So I wanted to re-clarify that point. So we had one RFP submitted for the solar and battery storage. And then we had another one submitted for just the water quality by itself. And the reason for that was because conservation was going to do their own peer review for the wetlands and the stormwater. So the zoning board, we thought it was appropriate, and the applicant agreed with us to, to pursue this, to go with the water quality and just the solar, the aspects that wouldn't have been affected as much by the change in the site plans. And the water quality came back with no responses because we as staff anticipated that wasn't a significant enough peer review for a firm to really consider submitting a proposal for. So our idea was to combine the remaining topics into a larger one so we could get the interest of firms who would be willing to solicit this type of work because there's a larger project for them to work on. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. The, you you actually answered part of my question, Rob. My, my question was going to be, is there a scenario where we can just put everything together yep. um, for one large peer review to get more responses from people? So I also want to add that... Um, we, we determined that because of the fact that nobody responded to the water quality peer review RFP, that that was the case, that you know people didn't want to waste their time applying for something that was going to take them like a week to do, um, dedicating the manpower to just doing like a small peer review that didn't really generate a big income for them. So the idea of combining it, we thought would attract more firms to want to be our peer review consultant for, for this project. And Chris... Do you want to add anything to that? So I want to uh, concur with Mr. Wachilla. Um, the amount of money that's associated with these peer reviews is relatively small. And for big engineering firms, you know, if they're going after projects that are $100,000 or more, it's hard for them to, you know, focus on something that's only going to be eight eighty five hundred, which is roughly what WSP is um, going to charge us. So, um, you know, I think it's it could build up their reputation or, you know, do something for them um, 
publicity wise, but it's not really going to do very much for them in terms of income. So I think that's one of the reasons why um, we didn't get the uh, number of responses that we had hoped. So, so I, go ahead, Mr. So I, I, I understand the, the hesitation with them being the only response, but does that mean because they're the only respond that they're not qualified or, or competent to do this? Um, to what everyone just said, that's the nature of business it is so small that more reputable and larger firms do not want to bid. So why wouldn't we go with this company if they're the only one that bid, understanding what we're facing? So I kind of alluded to that earlier. There's two reasons. The first reason um, people might be dissuaded from going with a firm that was the only firm that applied is because that firm might just be a recently created firm or a firm that doesn't have a lot of experience of doing these types of projects behind it. So they're trying to get their foot in the door. And the other reason is because some firms maybe have more resource available to them to where doing a project this small may not impact them, impact them negatively if they were to just dedicate one or two principal staff to doing it. In this case, we think WSP is the latter because they're specialized in doing these types of projects. So they have the manpower to consider doing this project and they already know the area anyways. Like they did another project in town. So they have a person on staff who who might know this and might be able to fit the time to do it and just keep a good relationship with the town in the process. Um, that's, that's kind of the impression that, that I'm getting from it, but... Mr. Meadows' main concern was the first point that I made, that it could be a firm that's just looking to get a project in to, on their resume, just to get their foot in the door somewhere. And from my previous job in a different town, that's kind of the experience that we had to deal with for, for peer review and for any sort of project where municipal finances were used. But, but my question is, based on what you've seen, um, mm -hmm. very simple, are they qualified to do this work? I believe so, yes, because they have a principal who's been doing this type of work for over a decade and they have staff who are going to be supporting him on this and they've done other projects, one other big project in town actually, but several projects across the Commonwealth. So I mean, me and Ms. Breshup believe they're very qualified for this peer review. Thank you. Yep. I got a couple of questions. Um, one, how far along are we with um, WSP um, given that we've already, I guess we have a contract with them, but we're kind of on yes. hold. Um, yep. Is that, if we wish to, if we would decide that we want to go for a, um, a new RFP to try to get more uh, responses, could we do that, or would we? Would it be in a situation where we breach the contract, and that in that case, would the town have to pay as opposed to the applicant if we went back and did a, a second RFP, or where are we on that? So that's the that's my first question. I'd like to defer that one to Miss Breshup if if she doesn't mind answering that question. Yeah, um, we've signed the contract with WSP. In the past, it's been common that the um, staff chooses the uh, peer reviewer and sign, and the town signs a contract um, with the peer reviewer. This has never come up as an issue um, to the extent that it's coming up on this project. And so we felt comfortable going along with WSP. And then, um, you know, people started asking questions about it. So we're bringing it to you to vote on it, but we did sign a contract and we would have to ask our uh, town attorney at um, KP Law um, what we could do about getting out of this contract if we chose to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't just do that on our own. Right. Okay. So there's some complications there. Next question I have is, I want to explore the, I want to explore the conflict issue briefly. It seems to me that the the allegation was that there's potential conflict of interest because Mr. Reedy represented a client who had as a subcontractor WSP. And that in this case, he's representing another client who may have as a subcontractor WSP. And that that is an appearance of conflict of interest because subcontractors of his two clients, because he had the same subcontractor for two clients. Is that 
a, is that the concern that was expressed? And is that your concern, Mr. Meadows, as well? It's it, my concern was simply the appearance, yeah. mm -hmm. not not the actuality, but the appearance. And I, you know, as I say, I have full confidence in Mr. Reedy to be objective on this stuff. But I, it it there is the potential to have an appearance of a conflict. Yeah, Mr. But Mr. Reedy doesn't decide in this case. I agree. It looks like you got but Mr. Reedy doesn't decide who the RF, who the right peer review person is, that's not his, so he had, has no role in making that decision. And we have to question, I guess the, the, the uh, question for us as a board is, number one, we're, we're already committed. Number two, um, there may not be other people that want to do this. And number three, that we can look at that we, with council, town council reviewing it and our, our own view is also important here. Looking at this, we can be concerned about a conflict of interest, but we may not be able to, but it's not a direct conflict of interest. It may be appearance of conflict of interest, and we may not be able to get a peer review from somebody else. And if we do, um, it's going to perhaps would cost the town to pay for this rather than having the uh, solar project pay for it. So uh, I'm trying to work work through all this. I don't want to have a conflict of interest, but I think we're maybe down to, we're down the road a bit on this one, that it's going to be hard to step back. And the appearance of the conflict of interest is a concern, but I don't see the direct conflict of interest. And we have some opinion from the town council, town counselor or town attorney that there is no conflict of interest. So I'm, I'm kind of inclined to go with I don't like the notion of a single respondent at all, but if we go back out with another RFP, we'd just be, we would be paying for one and the, and the applicant, we could be paying for one and the applicant could be paying for another. Uh, Mr. Sloganer. I am uh, sensitive to Mr. Meadows' concern about an appearance of a yeah. conflict of interest, but if the town staff feels that they're is no conflict of interest. And if Mr. Reedy clearly had no influence and doesn't control the, the peer reviewers, it seems almost just a coincidence that they're the same people. I'm not sure that Mr. Reedy even knew they were coming and he doesn't look like much of a mob boss that could put his, uh, his okay. own person into play there. So it doesn't I'm sensitive to an appearance of something, but if in fact there is no conflict, if the town staff is very comfortable that there's no conflict, I don't think that it's appropriate for us to give in to the potential of an appearance that you know one person may be concerned. I don't see anything sinister going on here. I'm a little bit, conf I mean, I now understand better why only one company responded but okay so only one company but if 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 mr wachilla and Ms. breaststrup both feel and the rest of the people who know these people feel that they are competent and qualified and experienced i don't see a problem with this and for the record i make share it. just move on and mm -hmm. and make the decision for the for the record i share david's position mm -hmm. The second, oh, oh, Mr. Meadows, did you want to respond? No, I, I, I will. I will go along with the town yeah. attorney's uh, assumptions. Yeah. So the second, so that's one issue. The second issue is, and I think we have a third issue that came up. The second issue is to is authorizing them, uh, them to advertise an RFP for four different subjects: site design, construction phasing impacts to water uh, three impacts to water quality mm -hmm. um, and that is we'd have to it start the process over again it seems to me you started one with water quality and you combined you got no responses you combined it with some other things now and so you're starting to prop the rfp process over again for uh, number two is that correct um yes but we already have most of that drafted up 
I mean, we have it just sitting in our folders. I mean, we're going to review it. Um, if the board authorizes us to go ahead and do it, we can have it out by early next week. Yeah, I mean, that started. I mean, it's it, just, it's not like it, we start the process over. It's not like it's going to delay us any further. Oh, I mean, I, I, what I mean is we haven't done anything. We haven't sent out the RFP yet. No, we haven't. We haven't because we wanted to wait for the board to, to yeah. discuss it with us and authorize us to do so. Because in the ZBA rules and regs, it says that the, the board right. picks. So if the board authorizes staff to pick on your behalf, right. then on the record, you have, you're delegating that responsibility to us. Yeah. And the second thing I wanted to say is I like the notion of the RFP to study. Um, it was rare, rare plants and amphibians and something else. And I don't think that's going to be the same kind of firm that you have for the, uh, the plant, the water quality construction and site design. And you might find that there's a whole, there's a, a community of peer review or in, uh, of firms that specialize in this in that kind of work. And I would think an RFP on those would make sense. I'd leave it up to the board to decide if they agree with me on that and, yeah. to, and, and to write the, uh, to identify the subjects. But I think that does make some sense. Uh, Mr. Chair, actually, I do, I do, there's a few firms that actually are comprehensive enough to include biologists and environmental scientists in mm -hmm. their staff. Like there's, you'd be surprised how big some of these firms are that have offices all over the country that employ like a hundred people, a single branch that have a vast range of different qualifications. So if, even if it was included as a topic, it could potentially, it could fit in some firm's scope and purview. It, it would have to be a larger firm. Yeah, so, but here's what I'm thinking. Have a separate RFP on that. Make sure that the person that gets the firms that you that see the RFP for, no, for the existing RFP also know there's an RFP out there for the the species, the endangered species, uh, where, however we want to phrase that, and amphibians and bats and, and endangered um, animals. Uh, and they may want to combine them together, and that would, that would be an advantage that they would have. But there may also be. I, I'm trying to make sure that you have as good of uh, um, coverage of potential uh, engineering firms as possible. Some would be small, um, environmentally focused, some are going to be construction focused. And if there's one that is both, they see they can combine the two. And you can just state that in the RFP. I okay. think. No, we can explore that. I mean, that's, that's not, Espresso. yeah, we don't disagree with that. that you, I think you can work that out. Yeah, Ms. Presto, you had your hand up. I wonder if Mr. Wachilla would put up the list of um, topics that we had talked about last October for the RFP yeah. or for the peer reviewer, just so we don't lose anything. Because I, I in my memory, I th thought there were five topics, but I could be wrong about that. But if Mr. Wachilla would just put up the list, we'd know for sure what we're dealing with. Yeah, let me just find it real quick. So if that takes some time, and that's that wouldn't affect the first motion. And while Rob is looking that up, let's let's do the first motion, um, and then we can discuss more on the second and potentially third instruction to staff. So what I would like to do is move to the first motion, which would be to authorize the planning staff to hire and work with WSP as a peer review consultant on the topic of solar glare study and battery storage on the board's behalf. Do I have a do I have such a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Aye. Moved and seconded. Yep, Ms. Brestrup. Is there any discussion, Ms. Brestrup? No, I'm fine. I, I okay. didn't need to uh, add to that. Got it. All right. It's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion. Um, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. The vote is four to nothing. Um, the first motion passes. Now Rob is going to pull up the um, earlier topics that we had, and we'll see if those should be included in the included in the second motion, or if they've already or third or third motion. I am still looking for that, Mr. Chair. I am incredibly sorry. I am going to find it as fast as I can. It's tricky when you're not on your uh, work desktop or using yeah. the uh, laptop that's provided to you. Uh, it would have been in the packet for the October 12th um, CBA meeting. 
October 12th. I'm going to check there one more time. Let's see. Well, I think I have those papers still here in my house from the October 7th. <laughs> it is. It's yeah. in, it is in 1.6 peer review documents. And there's at the very first heading says peer review topics. Oh, so it's in our current meeting packet. Okay. Yes, it is. It is? My apologies. <laughs> yes. I was smart enough to include it in this meeting packet as well. Thank you, Everald. All right. Oh, let's. Uh, the cover page. My yeah. Let's, the point. let's screen share that. There we go. All right. Yep. Um, so these are the topics. So as I mentioned, the ones that you just voted us to continue with and authorized us to essentially work with WSP on are just number six and number seven. So these are the two that we currently have a consultant for, for peer review. Yep. Number eight is an optional one we put in there in case we wanted uh, legal fees to be covered by the applicant. And then this one we're going to go with is a third-party construction monitoring during the construction process, which the board could make a possible condition, but we, we are exploring the idea, um, but that'll be for later on. Um, but right now we're combining site design construction phasing, which includes tree removal and the two construction phases. I believe phase A is to um, grub all the tree roots and stabilize the site. And phase B is to install the actual solar panels themselves. Um, impact to wetlands, after discussing with Conservation Commission, they're going to do their own peer review on this as well. So, uh, Ms. Breshup, I see you're pointing your finger at something. Are you, do you want to comment on that? So are we saying that we don't need number three because the Conservation Commission is uh, taking care of that? Okay. Yes. Right. So number three and number four, the Conservation Commission are going to do their own peer review on. So we're going to kind of combine the data that they get from their peer review with our own peer review and use that as a way of um, analyzing the project broadly so we don't have the applicant pay for the same topic twice, essentially. May so I if con come? May yep. I come? Yes. yes. So I understand that about number three, I understand how that's solely the responsibility of the Conservation Commission. But as far as stormwater management, I think there's a lot of stormwater management that's going to have to go on that is not under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. It's outside of the 100-foot buffer. And I think that the Zoning Board of Appeals should have its own peer review of stormwater management for the site as a whole. And we can take advantage of what the Conservation Commission finds, but I really feel like it's important to look at the site as a whole and not just um, have the focus be on the wetland issues and the 100 foot buffer. So that would be my opinion. So I think that we need peer review on topics one through five. That's what I would, or excuse me, uh, one, two, four, and five. That would be my opinion. And also, uh, Mr. Chair, we should, if the board wants us to do stormwater management as a peer review topic, we should add that to the motion yeah. you would have to make as well. And we, I agree with Chris. She brings up a good point. Um, I guess looking at the whole project comprehensively, stormwater design is very important. And if we group that as well as water quality with the first two items, I think that's going to be a big enough peer review that is going to attract more firms than zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I, I was unaware that the Conservation Commission wouldn't do stormwater management. So I agree with that. So one, two, four, and five. Yep. And we would amend the motion to include stormwater management plan. Yep. I would say okay. stormwater management and also do like a hyphen design. So stormwater, not just the management of stormwater, but also how they design their stormwater mitigation systems as well. Both very important things. Do we want to add the plant survey, amphibian survey, and bat survey here, or do we want to have it as a separate motion? You know, Craig, my suggestion would be to have it as a separate motion, but instruct the staff to make sure that they let the RFP know that there's there's this, if they let the respondents or the people that are reading this RFP know that there's a second one out there, or a third one out there. Because I think that does give big firms an opportunity to do both, and a small firm may just we may have a good small firm that just does environmental work. Right. No, yeah. I agree with that. I think doing it as a separate yeah. motion is good because that allows for us to do it as a separate RFP as yeah. well. Um, okay. and, but we can also go to the firms 
asking them about both so we yep. can get an idea of interest and stuff like that out. early on. Yeah. You're reaching out. Okay. I, I sense, cons I mean, I don't hear any objections to that. No. Um, I sense a consensus that we have site design, construction phasing, stormwater management plan, and um, and design, stormwater management plan and design. Is that, the, is that the terms you use, Rob? Yep. Stormwater management and stormwater design. Yep. All right. And then we have impacts to water quality. So unless we have people who wish to discuss that further, uh, I would entertain a motion to authorize planning staff to advertise an RFP for the following peer review topics, site design, construction phasing, impacts to water quality, storm water management and storm water design. So moved. And, and to authorize the planning staff to select <laughs> and hire a peer review consultant on the board's behalf while adhering to the appropriate processes of the ZBA rules and regulations on peer review selection. <sighs> All right. <laughs> so let's have, the, let's have the staff do their jobs, right? <laughs> All right. Do, any discussion? If not, vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. And the last thing is I think we should do the, um, the threatened and endangered species and plants. So that's, as I heard it tonight, and if you have others, it's amphibians. It's bats. bats. Is there any other? Uh, and then there was uh, some, some uh, plants. Plants. plants, some plants. And, and I think we have to be more um, specific than just plants. Um, otherwise we could have a pretty big you know, there's a there's a rare species that that uh, public comment yeah. uh, mm -hmm. reference. I don't remember what it was. I'll have to look through the recording. Uh, Mr. Cashin actually is raising his hand if you want to to tell us what that. You know, at, we rarely have public comment during um, public yeah. meetings, but this is the time when we need additional information. So yeah. perhaps yeah. Mr. Cashin can give us some language. Yes, could you please, Mr. Cashin, tell us the plant species that you reference? Yeah, it's um, the common name is small world and it's W H O R L E D Pagonia P O G O N I A. And I can um, provide the scientific name if that helps. Um, there, I was informed of two other rare plant species uh, on the site as well. Um, and I can get you the, the names of those. I think go, with, okay. Go, go ahead. What I was thinking, go ahead and we, we finish up and then I have a suggestion. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much, you know, now's the time to talk about it, but I just say, you know, if, if you need help in sort of crafting the language of the RFP, I'd be glad to help with that. You want a survey that is going to focus on, you know, it's, it's got to be appropriately timed. The Pagonia in particular has a very narrow blooming period. And so to, to properly identify that species, you have to be out there at the right time of year. Can't just, um, you know, so doing a plant survey after the plant blooms is not gonna be sufficient. And so I think you need to sort of outline those criteria in your RFP. Um, I would add that, you know, in addition to searching for and establishing presence and abundance and distribution of rare plants, it would be helpful to have just an overall inventory of plants. That's kind of mm -hmm. typical in a rare plant survey is that the botanist will record all the plants that they see. That's going to give you an idea of biodiversity. Um, and kind of same goes, th um, same is true for bats um, and amphibians. You know, um, bats are, are very difficult to detect that requires specialized equipment. And so that would require, you know, that that's something you'd want to specify in the RFP. So, so one of the things I was, my suggestion, uh, and I thank you, Mr. Cashin for your expertise. So my suggestion is that we authorize the planning staff to advertise an RFP uh, on the following peer review topics. Um, so on the, the, um, incidents of rare plants, including or such as small world Patagonia and others, right? Amphibians and uh, rare uh, uh, threatened amphibians and bats. But, uh, you know, I don't know that we want to 
tell them that we want to have an entire uh, inventory of every plant on the site or every animal that walks through the sites. I think we're just looking at the threatened or endangered um, plants that occur on that site um, because that's what we're that's what we're really concerned about. So. And the staff, and then authorize the staff to be specific in the. We will authorize the staff to be specific in the um, in the RFP. But I think we give them general direction in this in the next motion. And I also could um, I'll I'll look up Mr. Cashin's information and reach out to him as well for for um his um advice on how to craft a good RFP right. because he he did bring up some good points there. Um, but thank you. Does anybody think we need to be more specific than the mention of? Uh, rare plants um, such as the small world Patagonia um, and threatened or endangered amphibians, bats, and other plants. Makes I, I think it should say to include but not limited to. Yes, I, I agree with that. Yep, to include but not limited to. Okay. Right? Yeah. And okay. this is still part of the motion, right? <laughs> Are yes. We still... <laughs> okay. Well, this is, this, is the third, this is the third motion. The third motion, right? Okay. The third peer review is to authorize yeah. the planning staff to advertise an RFP for the following peer review topics, as we just discussed, with to include but not limited to those topics we discussed, and to um, to select and hire a peer review consultant on the board's behalf while adhering to the appropriate process of the ZBA rules and regulations on peer review selection. Do we have consensus on that? Close enough? And that's specific enough for Chris and Rob? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Then I would entertain a motion on that. So moved. Second. Great. Is any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs. I vote aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. All right. Motion carries four to nothing. We're done with peer reviews, I think. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair, Corey has her hand up. Yes, Corey. Ms. Yes. You're oh, muted. You're muted. Oh, they're just on the phone. No, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'll I'll make it quick. Um, I uh, we certainly will, you know, go forward with these uh, studies. Um, I just wanted to make it clear that the ZNRA will demonstrate um, th this is a potential for habitat. It is not saying that it is there, and you'll see with especially with the bats. They're along the entire east coast of the of the United States. Um, it's really just the potential for the bats to be there as habitat, but there's no known hibernacula. This study, and we'll do a study, and you know we'll show that. Um, and then I also wanted to make another point. Um, uh, this will all be funded by Pure Sky. We'll work with the we'll work with staff and you know with the peer reviewer to make sure the funds are um, sent and you know. Uh, processed appropriately, but this is, will not be funded by any taxpayer dollars by the town of Amherst. So just sure. wanted to make that clear. Yep, that's Thank right. Thank you very much for voting tonight. All right. So um, I think we've finished the business of the solar panels and the solar project. So I would entertain a motion to continue the public hearing on ZBA FY 2023, um, Shootsbury Road Solar Project to a specific date. and. We need a specific date to do that, Rob, and, and I'm not sure what you what we're looking at in terms of the dates for the next hearing. I, I so, did hear um, date that is so actually, it was um, requested by the applicant um, before this meeting to consider the first meeting in June. And if we're sticking to the normal, I, I believe it's the second and fourth Thursday of every is it first and third or second and fourth? I'm confusing myself now. My apologies. Um, second and fourth Thursday of every month. Um, the first meeting would be June 13th to continue this hearing date too. Does that work for the panelists and the applicant as a date to continue this hearing too? It's not a great date for me. I'm not no. sure that I could have some conflict with that day. Okay. So the next date what is about, June, what, June 27th what is, is the next day after that. Um, well, then we're getting into that time when I'm gone. So mm -hmm. what about, and, and what about that Thursday, the first Thursday of the month? The 6th of June? Yeah. 
Um, how do the other board members feel about that? That's an that's an off week meeting. Yeah. Um, but if everybody's schedule is clear, would that work for David, Craig, and Everald? Would that replace one of the other meetings? Um, probably not. If there's a bunch of submissions that we get, it's very possible that if we don't get any at all for June thirteenth, that that meeting's just going to get canceled or become an administrative meeting. But the, the other good news, Mr. Henry, is we've got a full set of, of um, alternate members now. And That's true. Full set of, yes. Full set of full members now. So, mm -hmm. yep. you, know, okay. you, you know, if you are, if there's a new topic that comes up for that uh, time when you can't be there, mm -hmm. we, we probably can cover it. But a continuing, it's more difficult when we have a continuing situation like we have here. Uh, I, you know, we can't just kind of come in and out, especially with only four members. I can make June 6th work. Yep. Mr. Reedy said it, it was probably just a touching base anyway, so. Yeah, let's I, make June 6th work. Yeah, I, I, can, I can attend June 6th also. All right. Awesome. Great. So I didn't, the motion is to continue this public hearing um, on ZDA FY 2023-18 to June 6th at 6 o'clock. Do I have a motion? Is there a second? Second. So moved, Mr. Chair. It's moved and seconded. Uh, the vote occurs. Chair votes aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Motion carries four to nothing. All right, we'll see you guys all on the sixth. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated. I, can I ask a quick question of Mr. Wachilla? Sure. Or, or the chair, or anyone, actually. <laughs> is, is the meeting on June 6th likely to only be the solar project? Yes, yes yeah. because it's an off-week meeting. It's an off-week, so we're doing mm -hmm. it specially for them. So yes. it'll only be solar, and it may not be a, no. a lengthy meeting anyway. No, okay. it's just going to be this, because usually we schedule public hearings, or sorry, new applications for a normally scheduled meeting date. Right. Yeah, but it's it's fine. I, it's purely informational. I'm mm. happy if it goes till nine thirty. I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're doing it for me. You're doing it for me. Yeah. I'm doing it for the chair, so he yeah, has. You're doing it for me. Yeah. yeah. Right. Not, we're not doing it for Pure Sky. We're doing it for me. Right. 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 Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the next order of business is ZBA FY twenty twenty four dash twelve. Rian Baker, formerly Patricia Teton. Request for a special permit under section 6.31 of the zoning bylaw to allow for the construction of a single family home on a flag lot requesting waivers from building. And I don't think lighting plans anymore, but from building mm. plans at 368 A Shea Street, mm -hmm. Matt 20 D parcel 78 RN neighborhood residence zoning district continued from um, February 22nd, 2024. Um, there's not been a site plan since the, we've initially since we initially uh, looked at this matter back in February, and so, I just want to pull up the uh, submissions. So, Mr. Chair, actually, there was um. Oh, sorry, you said site plan instead of site I, visit, Mr. Site, Chair. Site, site visit. I meant yeah. site visit, not site plan. Mm -hmm. I have too much in front of me at this moment. And here we go. Um, the submissions we have are in the draft application report. It's a light model. Submissions include light model and examples, lighting specifications, and lighting comparisons were received since the last uh, meeting. Um, we have, they're no longer requesting a waiver from lighting plants because they have a lighting plant, a light model and examples. Um, and that's it for, that's it for staff submissions or I, I saw no public comments to public submissions as well. So if there's nothing else, um, this is an opportunity for the applicant to make their case. So uh, Brian Baker is in attendance, and I did uh, give him a panelist invitation. He just has to accept it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do want to note that on the site plans, he did send us an updated site plan that has the details for the retaining wall that he's going to install on site. Um, that wasn't yeah. in the last copy of the site plans, but it was requested to be provided by yeah. the town engineer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he's finally, uh, the applicants finally uh, provide that to us. Okay. So Mr. Baker, um, please 
identify yourself and your address and uh, let us um, make your presentation. And uh, for, your, for your information, Mr. White is joining the panel um, for this matter. All right. Hello, Mr. White. Um, my name is Brian Baker. Uh, my home address is 95 Harlow Drive. The property and address is 368A Shays Street. I believe that uh, Mr. Wachilla noted before that there was a typo. So I'm just reminding you of that because you said you might forget. Um, That's good. Yeah, my, I tried to catch it. So, all right. 368. Great. Yeah. So last time there were uh, two requests. Number one was for a uh, wall detail, which was provided in the updated civil plan. Um, and the second part was concerns around lighting um, and lighting trespass and glare on the neighbors. Um, rather than submitting a plan, uh, I submitted a modeled uh, image because I think it was clearer to do that to show um, the intention. Um, I'm not sure if you'd like me to share the documents or if you have the documents you know, I, available. I think that the, let's deal with the lighting plan first or the lighting um, idea first. Yeah. So, it would be, you know, it'd be helpful to you to share the uh, before, the, something that's before and after. I'm just not quite sure what that is. I guess that's what you originally proposed and then you changed your mind and have a different no, that's not the case. Uh, those are just examples of of what I'm proposing. So uh, what I'm proposing is shielded dark skylighting. The concern was lighting trespass on the neighbors and glare. Um, and the suggestions at the time were, you know, how are you going to be able to build a fence high enough? How are you going to be able to get trees in the right places um, in order to prevent, you know, a, a harsh light shining through the back window of the neighbor's place and um, I think that, you know, those are, are valid points. And so what I'm proposing instead is dark sky compliant lighting. Um, the name, you know, comes from the idea that it's not meant to cause light pollution um, and, you know, limit visibility of stars and whatnot. Um, but the light that I've specified, um, you know, the other benefit of dark sky lighting is it also reduces lighting trespass um, to adjacent properties. So if you look at the shielded light and at the model, and I can also share the, the actual model and rotate around it, um, because the light is shielded horizontally, the only trespass in terms of glare is in a cone out from the light. If you look at the specification sheet where the light is turned to its side, you can see that the LED light array is recessed up into the cylinder. And so there is no direct view to the light from anywhere. And the model is meant to show with the stepped contours and whatnot that even with the, the ground dropping down, there is no angle at which you could directly see those lights and have the experience of glare. You would have to be within you know, 10, 15 feet of the house in order to have the experience of glare from those lights because of how the light is recessed up into the shielded fixture. And I think if you share the specification sheet, um, yeah. you'll be able to see a little bit of how that's constructed and why that's the case. Oh, good, you put them all together. So this is these are examples of dark skylighting and how you cannot see the glare from the actual bulb. You just see the glow on the surfaces that you're trying to light uh, and that it doesn't project out. Or the ones at the bottom there on the stairs are not dark sky compliant lights. Those are stair lights, but the ones above are. This is another example where you'd have to be right up adjacent in order to be able to see glare from the light, that the light is directed and doesn't trespass into adjacent properties. And then those other ones are examples of more conventional lighting fixtures that aren't dark sky compliant and how that issue of glare uh, is very apparent in these situations. Um, I don't know if you can see through the fence there in that example, but the point of that one is there was another one and there's a person standing in that opening of the gate of the fence and the glare is so bad that you can't see the person because you're blinded. Um, and then there's another example where you can easily see the person because they've shielded the light. So my, my proposal is to have all of the lights specified as shielded fixtures that would not allow tri light trespass to adjacent properties. All right. So that's the light, your lighting proposal. Um, yeah. and the only thing I, it seems to make sense. I, I understand what you're saying. The problem, the thing that, that 
you're trying to solve is that that cone of light doesn't extend as the as the ground drops away the cone of light um, goes farther down the the, the uh, ground towards the neighbors as the um, light as, as the as the ground drops away if it drops well, it was flat, it was flat it would only go so far if it drops away it has to go down a little bit farther and you're saying that it doesn't it, it won't it, it, that you looked at it and said that it won't be within it won't trespass on their land because it, it won't go it won't proceed down that hill far enough to trespass on their land is that what you're saying it looks like rob wants to say something rob yeah i just want to uh clarify point um so usually the biggest issues from light fixtures is that you know he brings a good point about the glare mm -hmm. so you know vehicle headlights is always the biggest thing the board is trying to condition against with screening and stuff like that because the headlight the 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 majority of the light is going towards that person's window or view shed. And so what he's proposing is that the main, <clears throat> I guess the visual of the light, the brightness of the light is directed upwards. So the residual light is being pointed down in the reflecting motion. That's still able to light the area around it without going into neighboring properties or really causing a big glare on abutting properties nearby. So that's why well, the fixture is designed in a way to where it prevents that glare from spilling out while still being able to light the area around it. Am I, am yeah. I understanding that correctly, Brian? I mean, sort of. So so prior to dark sky considerations, when people started trying to control light trespass, you know, and a lot of what they were trying to control was light trespass up in order to keep animals from having issues, in, in order to keep us from being able to see stars, in order to keep, you know, just illumination from getting up and, and polluting the sky in such a way that you can't see stars in the city. Um, but the, the other benefit of it is that most light fixtures that were unregulated in any way are like a bulb sitting inside of a black a glass case. You can see the whole bulb. Light is shooting in all directions. And the whole point of putting up a fence or screening trees is to put some sort of barrier around that bulb. Well, the nice thing about dark sky compliant lights is that the fixture is the barrier around the bulb. Like you said, with headlights or things like that, the the light trespass that is, you know, harmful or annoying or you know, really bad in cities is the light where you're looking around and all of these bare bulbs are exposed in all directions, and so as a screening issue, what what it does is it puts the screening at the level of the fixture, and light can only go down, and illuminate the space directly around the house, illuminate the front door, illuminate the front stoop, the areas where you need to see so that people don't trip on their steps or are in danger, or can't see who's at their front door, but it doesn't allow light to go sideways. And can, do you want me to bring up that that spec sheet or does somebody have that spec sheet to look at? You know, so I understand what you're saying. I don't, I understand, I kind of understand dark sky compliant lighting. All I care about is I don't want the neighbors who are downhill from you to be, have their property washed with your lights. That's yes, what- and that and and you're and, and you're asking and you're not providing a lighting plan and i think you are in good faith providing a plan a um, not a specific you don't have a photometric plan but you have i think in good faith given us some um uh, what you think will not will prevent light washing on your neighbor's property so there is there but is I'm, a photometric but I, and my concern is that if it does that if it does wash on your neighbor's property you've got to change this because we're going to condition this application of the, the special permit on making sure that the light doesn't wash on their property, right? Can I can I make a clarification? Yep. So on the specification sheet, there is photometric data and that cone of light that's shown in the model is based off of the photometric data from that spec sheet. It is showing the, the that, that spec sheet shows a distance that the light will be able to travel based on the height of the light. Um, <laughs> And, and that, that angle of light off of the photometric sheet is what is shown in that model that shows how far the light will be able to go, which is far, far away. It's, you know, it's dozens of feet away from the, the neighbor's property in terms of where that will be able to project. So that's great. Yep. All I'm saying is that we are not requiring, we're not requiring you to do a photometric study. No, well, he has it's the data. Not, he has, he has the certain, and, exactly. and you have data for lamps that that, show, <clears throat> that purport mm -hmm. not to wash onto neighboring property. 
If it doesn't work and you're wrong, you're going to have to change it. All right. Okay. That's, yep. that's my point that that's going to be a condition of the application of the special permit. Yeah. Understood. And you, okay, understood. Yeah. Okay. Rob. I do want to, so he, he did essentially get the data that they used to make those photometric plans. Like he had it, he just, instead of doing like the site plan with the numbers, he just did like a 3d model version of it. Um, so at the last meeting, people were saying that they had a hard time visualizing where the light would land. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to make sure, especially in terms of elevation and height, and that's why I did it from the side instead of as a plan, because I wasn't sure that it would be as clear where the light would follow. I, th um, I think you have made a good faith effort. I think you're trying to do the right thing, right? Yeah. I just want to make sure that you know that absent a, a lighting plan that we approved, because we didn't have a, light, a specific lighting plan, if yeah. this doesn't work out and it's washing on the neighbors, you're going to have to fix that. Understood. Okay. Um, and you, any other questions about light? I don't, I, I don't mean to dominate the uh, discussion about lighting. Mr. Sloter, I know you raised the issue in the last meeting about the lighting and, and the sloping. Yeah, and it was my major concern. I mean, the, the water runoff was the other one, but the lighting was because the property is so steep in a certain point that even if the light, and I do recognize that there is a good faith effort and the drawing is probably fairly accurate. The spec sheet has a lot of figures on it. I, and I don't think it's deceptive, but I share the chair's concern that it it may look like it's going to work and then once it's up there because the property is as steep as it is if somebody is looking up we may you may not expect that the glare will be visible but at a certain angle it may it may just be and i support what the chair said so yes this seems like a good faith effort i can't quite re i I looked at the spec sheet. It's got a table and diminishing candle power visibility and everything. And it looks like, yeah, maybe it would work uh, when it's applied to that particular property. I just share the the chair's warning that, uh, yep, it looks like it might work. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to do something. So. I, I can support this as a good faith effort that answers the concern that I brought up last time, but it needs to, in practical terms, it needs to work. Yeah. And then you had another, you were gonna raise a second point and I interrupted you on the lighting, Mr. Baker, and I, I wanna give you a chance to get back to your second point. Oh, what, did I have a second point about the lighting? No, uh, you were going to move on to something else. That oh, I, I started with that. It was about the, the other con, uh, requirement was that I come with a uh, retaining wall detail, which yes. is included in the civil plan. Yeah. And Rob, do you want to throw that up? To... Yeah, I can do that. Uh, just give me one second. So we can see it and then the public can see it and we can move on to any other further questions or public comments. And Mr. Chair, I do want to announce that we have five people in attendance now for this hearing. Okay. All right. All right, here are the plans. So this is the overall site plan. I also want to note that the shape of the house also changed as well. Yes, thank you. I forgot to mention that. So I believe so there when... used to be a part back here, right? And then you made it um Right, so Patricia Teeden, who was going to buy the property and has since mm -hmm. withdrawn, um, had a particular pre-modular or a modular pre-manufactured home that she wanted on the property. This actually has a slightly smaller footprint and it's just not, doesn't have all the jigs and jags in and out that were complicating. Uh, it, it basically just smooth out the, the perimeter, but it's a, a slightly smaller footprint. Uh, the civil engineer says it, it impacts the stormwater considerations, not at all, uh, and redrew it uh, like this. Uh, and so everything else, the rainwater, uh, the rain garden, um, and the retaining walls and everything else is still in place. It's just taken out the jogs that were in the front and the back uh, in the perimeter to make it a simpler profile. And that's reflected in the model. And then this is the um, retaining wall detail right here. Correct. Right. 
Any questions from members of the board? Any comments? All right. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. White has his hand raised. Oh, Mr. White. Oh, you're you're muted. There you go. Yep. Um. <clears throat> So my question is more to the project application draft um, mm -hmm. with reviewing the updates on it. Um, considering that Mrs. Tien is no longer involved, um, we might just need to modify this, uh, but under the proposal section, uh, it states the flag lot was created 2016. I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but it says the current owner, Brian Baker, is selling the land to the applicant, Patricia Teton, who wishes to construct a single family home with an attached garage. Mm -hmm. um, so since that is no longer the case, would that need to be modified in the application? Yes. Yes. Yeah, she is no okay. longer purchasing the property. So, um, Philip, could you tell me what page you found that on of the project application report so I can update it? Absolutely. It's on page two um, towards the bottom under proposal. Thank you. No, not a problem. All Thanks, right. Mr. Chair. Oh, good catch. Thank you. All right. Um, if there's no other comments, um, we open this up for public comment. No other comments from the board, we'll open up for public comment. Is there anybody on the board or any public, any members of the public who wish to comment on this? If you wish to make a comment, please use the raise hand function or press star nine if you're calling into the meeting on telephone. Seems Kirk, we have yes. no, all right. Seems we have nobody who wishes to speak on this matter. Yep. All right. That being the case, uh, I would entertain a motion that we move to the public meeting on um, this matter, ZBA FY 2024-12, while keeping the public hearing open. So I have a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion is moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on moving to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. Chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? And Mr. Slow. I, I saw the nod from Mr. Meadows, so mark him down as a yes, even though he's muted. And Mr. Sloviter? Aye. All right, we got the vote is five to nothing. Um, so, this is the time, the public meeting is a time where the board deliberates on the, on the matter before us and it's not generally a time for public comment. And my first reaction is I think the applicant has answered some of the questions that we raised um, in good faith. And I'm inclined to approve the application, the special permit application at this point. Um, I don't want if anybody else has comments. General comments. If not, I'd move to the conditions and we can start talking about those. Mr. Sloviter. I, I have a question of Mr. Wachilla, I think. Yep. Did, did any town engineers who know more about stormwater runoff and retention than I do review the site plans and render an opinion on whether the rain yep. garden and the general stormwater runoff control is properly done yep so uh jason skeels who was our town engineer he works in the dpw he reviewed the plans he provided feedback and actually he said the plans look good the rain garden was a good idea um the only concern he had was that the retaining wall details were included so that's why the applicant had to provide them after the fact but david to answer your question yes he did and he thinks it's a good design and and is re and is reasonably confident that yes that the new the newly created impermeable sur impermeable surface or something in English um, that will increase um, stormwater runoff is not going to be a problem for the properties below. No, because of where the rain garden's placed. So okay. it's placed in a spot where you can catch all that runoff and it's graded down towards it in a way that funnels the water in that direction. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I was concerned about those people and a lot of water. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. 
Um, there are a series of conditions in the um, project, the draft project application report. Uh, we can review those quickly. I don't have anything to add to that. I don't know if anybody else has other conditions they wish to to add to this, or if they have any other concerns on this this project that they wish to um, raise. Mr. Chair, I do want to note that I'll update those dates for the approved plans because I, I had forgotten to do that in this most recent update. Um, I will ensure that under condition one that those plans referenced are all accurate. Yeah. And yeah. I'll include the lighting plans in there as well. So my apologies for not including that information into this part of the report. All right. So I, I mean, I, the first condition is, you know, general, you got to build to the plan that you've submitted. Uh, the second one deals with lighting to be down shield or downcast. And this is the one um, that where if Mr. Baker, where if it's not, um, if, trespass, if it does trespass on other property and they bring it to the building commissioner's attention and he deems that it's, that that's happening, you're going to have to fix it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Street numbers um, for the dwelling unit should be clearly marked. There's unimpeded access should be provided across either strip or the easement at 50 feet wide. I'm not sure why that's there, Rob. I, I looked at that before. And is that just allowing the public to cross the the access strip? The so that's, that's usually a, a typical condition we include for flag lots because uh, we want to ensure continuous access between the street and where the building is along the flagpole portion of it. It's yeah. just a way to ensure that there's no sort of um, obstruction that goes in there. I mean, we, we usually include this as a safeguard in conditions for flag lots. Um, but if the board wants me to take it out, we could, but it's just- No, if, it, if it's included, I just didn't recognize it. And I, yeah, I, it makes sense, it makes sense. It's, it's actually, um, it's a requirement of the flag law uh, section of the bylaw anyways. And we usually right. throw it in here just so we can enforce it. Number five deals with um, having, before you get a building permit, the, you need the uh, trench permits and other things from the Amherst Public Works. The rain gardens shall be maintained in good operational condition as detailed in the approved stormwater operation and maintenance program. We looked at that and talked about that uh, at the last meeting. Parking shall occur only on improved surfaces and it should be maintained as needed. Uh, and the trash receptacles shall be screened from the public's right of way or is that the public view? The public better way on the streets, yeah. That's usually what we go with because um, the bylaw says it can't be seen from the street. So as long as it's not seen from the street and screened somewhere off site, then they're in compliance. Okay. Does anybody have any other any questions about these conditions or additional conditions that they wish to add? If if not, I think it answers my questions regarding the lights. Um, I would move. I would entertain a motion that we approve the conditions one through eight and authorize the staff to make technical and conforming changes, including updating the plans that were submitted by the applicant in the correct dates. Do I have such a motion? Yep, I got a, a yes from Mr. Sloviter and yeah. I have a second from Mr. Meadows. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> It's made and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion? If there's no further discussion, yes, Mr. Soldier. I, I have a question. Yeah. If Mr. Baker sells this property after it's completed, do all of these conditions automatically go to the new owner? Yes. And I'm thinking mostly of maintaining the rain garden in proper operational condition. That's a requirement that will... <laughs> attached to this property no matter who owns it correct yes it, 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 as long as there's as long as that special permit it's not attached to the it's not a it's not attached to the deed but as long as there's a special permit for this property and he needs a special permit to keep it there it will it will um attach to this, that special permit this i, I don't know how this, this special permit i don't think can go away no, it can't. It has to remain in effect. And yeah. you couldn't have a house there without the special permit. Yeah. And usually it's enforced if, um, say, the rain garden was so bad and clogged and it was spilling onto people's properties that somebody complains 
to inspection services, then that's when this permit would be reinforced and the new owner would have to clean it up. Okay. Um, so and yes, we, to answer your question, we, David, yes, it would be. Okay. And the new owner has to comply with the, with the, um, yes, the operations plan that's submitted for the rain garden. And okay. I do want to bring up one thing, Mr. Chair, if that's okay. Yeah, um, sure. So when I was drafting these conditions with Mr. Moore, the building commissioner who couldn't be here tonight, he told me that since because this is going to be a single family home on a flag lot, as opposed to a more intensive residential use, um, say that would be associated with like a rental use or something like that. Um, he didn't feel it was necessary to include a condition where a new owner of this property would have to meet with the building commissioner. And that's what he suggested to me. That's why that condition wasn't placed in here. Because you know, for other projects, we've typically included that as a condition where owner has to meet the building commissioner to ensure compliance with the management plan. But since this is such a low intensive use, he felt it was necessary to leave that out. And does the board, is the board in agreement with that, that that's an appropriate path for this type of development? In this project well we don't typically impose that condition on owner occupied new homes okay I all don't right think, I mean, I, no, I, no we, we don't historically we don't do that's why. Owner -occupied new homes but but yeah. we don't typically do that and yeah and i just want to make that perfectly clear to the board as to why you know if a new owner were to come in they wouldn't be required to have to meet with the building commissioner because it's a single family home, it's going from one person to another, but these conditions will always remain in effect with the land. They don't expire as soon as it's enacted upon, as soon as Mr. Baker sells it to somebody and they construct a building on it, or he constructs a building on himself, the permit becomes effective. Right. So you have, to, you have to exercise a special permit within two years after it's granted in order for it to remain current and effective still. But the conditions attached to any effective Yes. Special permit and that special permit is yes. all on this. It, and the two year statute that I just mentioned is state law. So that's not going to nullify itself for any reason. Okay. I have no problem with not requiring the next owner to sit down with the building commissioner, the next owner of a single family home. Yes. All right. Any comments or questions? If not, um, I would entertain the motion I stated, which is approval of the conditions authorizing the staff to uh, make technical conforming changes, including updating uh, correcting the dates of the most recent submissions by the applicant. So moved. Second. Okay. All okay. right. The vote occurs. If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the conditions. Um, the chair votes aye. Mr. Sloboda. Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. And Mr. White? Aye. All right. The vote is five to nothing. The conditions as, uh, are approved. Next, we have a couple of findings we have to make. Um, in addition to the findings, the, the normal findings under um, 10.38. And there are a series of there's a series of findings regarding dimensional regulations on flag lots. And to summarize them, each of the, each of the applicable requirements of the flag lot section, section 3.2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 6, 7, and 7.0 are all met by the applicant and the dimensions all work. Um, and they're all within the, the, um, the zoning bylaw. There's one that is not um, applicable. And I'm just, I'm not seeing that one right now. I thought there was one that was not applicable. Oh, at one point, the part of 6.33, the driveway does not exceed a 45 degree angle. So um, I would move that we adopt the findings on section 6.32, 6 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, uh, that's the one that there's no flag lots adjacent to it, 6.37, um, and 7.70. Is there a motion to do that or are people looking at these findings? 
Let's have a motion out there and we can discuss it if people have a question. So moved. So moved. All right. If any discussion, moved and seconded. I heard two voices. There's no further discussion on the findings for um, the flag lot section. Um, the vote occurs on approving, making the board making these findings. Uh, the chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. And Mr. Henry? Aye. All right. And now we have our, our standard 10.38 um, findings that are, are required. 10.380 and 10.381 deals with suitability that where it's located and this is a residential district and it's a residential use. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 all deal with um, creating a nuisance or um, disrupting uh, substantial inconvenience or hazard to neighbors or visibly, visibly offensive structures, also light trespass. And I think that the, in the conditions that the um, uh, applicant has proposed, including the, the downcast uh, lighting and his, his um, attempt, and I think goodwill attempt to keep from light trespass, uh, he has met the, uh, as well as the, the rain garden, uh, the, the rain garden and the uh, um, brick wall or the stone wall, he has met the requirements of 10.38. 383, 385, and 387. 10.384 deals with appropriate facilities for the proper use. It's got um, town water and sewer on site. 10.386 deals with parking sign regulations, parkings in conformance with Article 7 of the bylaw. 10.387 deals with providing safe and convenient vehicular traffic. Um, nobody found that there was any, I think we can find if there's no issues on vehic vehicular and pedestrian traffic movement on the site. 10.388 uh, does not apply uh, if we're not dealing with off-street loading and of, of uh, vehicles. 10.389 deals with proposal to provide adequate methods of disposal of so sewage and refuge. The applicant has provide, proved that they will have an appropriate facilities and they will eventually hire a trash service. That's in the management plan. 10.390 does not apply. It deals with um, Flood hazards, 10.391 protects the deals with uh, unique or important natural or historic features. Um, you know, I guess trees are natural features, and many of them are still will be will remain on the site with minimal trees being uh, cut down only for the uh, building site. Um, the proposal 10.392 the proposal provides adequate landscaping including screening of adjacent residential uses. Uh, we discussed this in the, in the first meeting where they're dealing with where he, they show the natural screening uh, on all sides of the property and to, to reduce the amount of light trespass from cars. 10.393 uh, provides um, protection on um, intrusion of lighting, parking lot and exterior lighting. Um, again, that, the, the applicant has provided a plan that I think will satisfy that, but if it does not, um, he'll have to fix it and he understands that. 10.394 deals with um, impact on steep slope floodplains and scenic views grades changes. The slopes in the site will be, will, won't, be, uh, um, won't be affected ex except for the um, fill on the place where the, the house will sit and there's uh, building walls, uh, retaining walls to support the structures. 10.395 uh, deals with disharmony with respect to terrain and uh, on the use and scale. It basically, does it, does it fit in with the neighborhood? And does not, I don't think it creates a disharmony within the terrain, the use of scale of architecture or the kind of building in, the, in that area. 10.396 deals with screening for storage areas. The, the applicant will, um, um, screen the trash receptacles, but or keep them in the garage. 10.398 deals with harmony of general purpose and intent of the bylaws and the goals of the master plan. This creates more housing in Amherst, uh, more residential housing and single family housing. So for all those reasons, I think we can find that the application meets the requirements of 10, section 10.38. Um, 
from 10.380 to 10.396. Is there any, um, I'll, I'll entertain a motion, we can have discussion on the, on the findings. Um, I'd, I'd move, I'd entertain a motion to approve the, the findings, 10.38. So moved. So moved. Moved and seconded, any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the findings and the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. The next order of business is the vote to approve the special permit application, um, ZBA FY 2024-12, with conditions, and to close the hearing, the public hearing on such application. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? If there's no discussion, uh, the vote occurs on the motion. Mr. Henry, or chair votes aye first. <laughs> Mr. Henry, second. Aye. Kind of rushing through this, I'm forgetting my own vote. <laughs> Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. And Mr. Sloboder. Aye. The vote is 5-0 to approve the special permit application and to close the hearing on the special permit. Mr. Baker, uh, congratulations, good luck. Thank you very much. I hope you are happy in your home and that your neighbors are um, do benefit from your goodwill in trying to avoid the light trespass or in the water going down to their property. Thank you. Thank you. And Brian, before you head out, I will uh, touch base with you tomorrow regarding next steps. Um, Thank you. Just a heads up, there is a 20 day appeal period process for special permits. So I'll, I'll discuss all that with you tomorrow. Okay. Sounds fantastic. Appreciate it. No problem. Congratulations, Mr. Baker. Thank you. Have a Have wonderful night. night. You as well. Thank you. Um, the next order of business is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. So this is a place where the public can speak on any matter that they wish, except for those before the board. I see no hands, no attendees whose hands are up. The only people that I, I think that are listening anymore are us. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, we just two about us. Just us. Two people who yeah. forgot to log out of the meeting still listening yeah. to us. Yeah, just yeah. us and our transatlantic friend over there. So we get <laughs> it's what's going on in Amherst tonight. Um, it's Rob. Is there any new business? What's the schedule coming up? Uh, so we have two hearings scheduled for May 9th Uh, one of them is for a converting a single family home into a non-owner occupied duplex on uh, I think it's North Whitney Street and the other one is for oh, gosh it's escaping me um it'll come back to me but it has it's for a flag lot actually 47 Redgate Lane um applicants trying to put a single family home on a flag lot um and then on April 30th uh, which is Tuesday, a few of you on the call actually have a meeting for continued hearing uh, 50 McClellan Street in which the existing special permit is going to be modified to change the occupancy status from owner-occupied converted dwelling to non-owner-occupied converted dwelling with two units. Other than that, Mr. Chair, we have three potential hearings scheduled for May 20, I think it's 27th. That's the next meeting in May after the 9th. Um, 20, other than 23rd. 23rd, my apologies. Thank you. 23rd. And other than that, nothing else in the books, Mr. Chair. That's it. Okay. All right. Any other matters that um, members wish to bring up? The one thing I will say is that we've got some new members um, on the. We have Mr. Sloboder is a new full member. We've got four, um, not all are new, but we have four um, alternate members. And at some point in the near future, we're going to try to schedule a, an administrative meeting just to, um, especially for the new members to go run through the, um, the duties and responsibilities of being a ZBA member and allow them to ask any questions and to give them the benefit of all your experience uh, as ZBA members. And we'll try to schedule that as soon as possible. There's other sort of um, ministerial work that we have to do once a year and we'll do, we'll do that as well. So um, 
we'll have that scheduled. Maybe we can do that one of these um, main meetings, but we'll see, Rob. We'll have a, and have they, have they had a chance, the new, the new members had a chance to meet with staff and go over the, not yet? Not yet, I'm still trying to, to do that. I'm in the process of scheduling meetings with them. Uh, right now, to my knowledge, Hilda and Sarah are still continuing to serve. Hilda was reappointed for another term to 2025. Sarah's gonna continue the rest of her term till the end of June. And then um, two new members are associates whose terms were effective immediately. Mm -hmm. So we have two new associates who can start taking over for public hearings right. when they're available to. Yep, and they they understand all the papers they have to sign and the conflict of interest and all that. Yep, okay. all that stuff. They were provide all that, so they're good. All right. Well, um, I think that's uh, everything I have. If there's nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. There's got to be a second to that, I know. Oh, I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> I think one. Actually, I think Mr. White. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. White gets the second already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you guys have all seconded tw two, three at a time for several motions. So you're making it hard yeah. for me. <laughs> he's even. He's even into tomorrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's that trans <laughs> transatlantic delay. You would have been, you would have had more seconds, but you got that transatlantic delay. All yeah. right, this is not debatable, but it is. We can joke about it. The motion is not debatable. All uh, chair says aye. Uh, Mr. White, aye. Mr. Meadows, aye. Mr. Henry, aye. Mr. Slavater, a reluctant yes. <laughs> all right. Have a good week, guys. Thank you all. And we did it by 912. So.